In this section, we're going to start working on the Transactions feature of our application. Most of our focus has been on registration and authentication. We've completed this feature of our app. The next goal is to allow users to create, read, update, and delete transactions. A table in our database will be necessary for storing transactions. The first step is to design the table. Once again, we're using the Draw SQL application to help us design the table. It's going to give us an idea of what our table should look like before writing a single line of code. So, I'm going to add a new table called Transactions. The goal of the Transactions table is to store a list of transactions performed by a user. After all, we're developing an expense tracking application. The user is going to need to store their transactions on our site. Let's create a few columns. The ID column is already prepared for us. For the second column, let's add a field for storing a short description of the transaction. Add another column called Description. Set the data type to varchar. Next, let's create another column for storing the amount. Add a column called Amount. Set the data type to decimal. Databases have two data types for storing numbers with decimals, called decimal and float. As we know, the data type used in the database is based on the data type of the property. In the example, we're using decimal. So, what are the differences? We've talked about floats before. They're a data type found across multiple programming languages. This includes databases. For as long as they've been around, programmers have faced an issue storing approximate values. Sometimes, this data type tends to modify the decimal values with terrible accuracy. Using floats for mathematical operations is unreliable. For this reason, the decimal data type was introduced in databases. Unlike the float data type, the decimal data type has better accuracy, as it can attempt to store numbers with exact precision. There are more differences than what I mentioned. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to an article that provides additional information. I recommend checking it out after finishing this lecture. When dealing with money, it's recommended to use decimal. What if our users are using our application to track business expenses for tax purposes? Our application would provide inaccurate results, which can be a major issue. For this reason, we're using the decimal type. Let's continue adding the other columns. Afterward, let's add three columns with the date time data type. Their names will be called date, created at, and updated at. Similar to the users table, we're adding columns for when the transaction was created and updated. We're adding an additional column for a date. Transactions don't always happen the moment a database record is created. The transaction could have occurred a week or month ago we should allow users to add transactions from the past. The date column will be responsible for storing the date when the transaction was actually performed. We're almost finished with the transactions table. There's one more thing I want to add before writing code. In the next lecture, let's talk about a new concept related to databases. In this lecture, we're going to finalize the design of the transactions table. So far, our table seems complete. There's one more piece of information that should be established before we write an SQL query. Transactions should be assigned to users. Not all users are going to have the same transactions. It would be ridiculous to list out every single transaction in our database. Only transactions created by the user should be connected to their account. The question is, how do we connect data from one table to another table? Databases have a feature called relationships. We're not facing an uncommon situation. The purpose of using tables is to categorize and organize our data. Naturally, data is not always isolated. In some cases, you may need to associate data from one table with another table. This type of feature is referred to as a database relationship. It's when data from one table is connected to data from another table. For databases, there are three types of relationships. The first type of relationship is known as a one-to-one -one relationship. It's when one row from a table has related data from another row in a table. For example, 
Let's say we were developing an application for a landlord to manage their rental properties. We may have a table for storing a list of homes owned by the landlord. Another table can store a list of tenants. One tenant can occupy a house, and one house can be rented by a tenant. Houses can't have multiple tenants, nor can tenants rent multiple houses. Therefore, we have a one-to-one -one relationship. The second type of relationship is one-to-many. Alternatively, you may hear it referred to as many-to-one. They mean the same thing. This relationship refers to when one row in a table has many rows of related data in another table. For example, let's say we had an online store. We may want to track which cities our customers live in. We would have two tables called cities and customers. Multiple customers can live in the same city. However, a single customer can only live in one city. The proper naming depends on the perspective of the table. From the perspective of the cities table, one city can have many customers. So, we could say the relationship is one to many. If we were to view things from the perspective of the customers table, many customers can live in one city. Therefore, we can say many to one. The last type of relationship is many to many. It's when many table rows from one table can have many related data from another table. For example, let's say we were storing a database of films. A film can have many genres. Vice versa, a genre can store many films. Therefore, this type of relationship can be referred to as many-to-many. -many. So, that's relationships in a nutshell. But, the question is, how do we connect the data from one table to data from another table? The answer is foreign keys. A foreign key is a column in a table that stores an ID from another table. By storing the ID of another table, we'll be able to identify which row of data is associated with another row of data. I have a question for you. What type of relationship do you think the users and transactions tables are? I think it makes sense to use a one-to-many relationship. One users can have many transactions, whereas a single transaction can belong to a single user. Next, we have to ask ourselves, which table stores the ID of the other table? Generally, a foreign key is added to the table that can't exist on its own. As a rule of thumb, you have to ask yourself one question. Can the transactions table exist without the users table? The answer is no. Without the users table, we cannot present transactions to the user. Therefore, this table should be responsible for storing the foreign key. Add a new column called user ID. A common naming convention for foreign keys is the name of the table in singular form with the word ID attached to it. We're not finished yet. We must establish the relationship in our schema design. Click on the users table. After doing so, dots appear next to each column. We can click on a dot for a respective column to draw a connection to another table. In this example, we're trying to connect the user's ID to the user ID column in the categories table. You may be wondering, why are we using an ID? Technically, we can connect tables with any column. However, it's considered good practice to use IDs since they never change. Let's drag a line from the ID column in the Users table to the User ID column in the Transactions table. Next, we must specify the type of relationship. Since we dragged the line from the Users table to the Transactions table, the relationship would be called one-to-many. After selecting this relationship, pay close attention to the line. Clicking on the line to view the relationship can be a hassle. Luckily, the line tells us what kind of relationship we have on our hands. The end of the line on the users table is a straight line, which indicates one. On the other hand, we have these additional lines sticking out of the straight line. This symbol indicates many. That takes care of the first relationship. Our database schema is ready. Now that we have an idea of what the table is going to look like, let's start writing an SQL query. In the next lecture, we'll start this process. In this lecture, we're going to write the SQL query for creating the transactions table. The query is going to be based on the model we designed from the previous lecture. For your convenience, here's an image of the model. I'll have it alongside my code so that you can view it as we write the query. In your editor, Open the database.sql file. Multiple queries can be written inside a SQL file. 
it's important to add a semicolon character after the end of each query. In our case, add this character at the end of the create table query. On a new line of code, add the following. Create table, if not exists, transactions. We're using the create table keywords again to create the table. In addition, we're using the if not exists keywords to prevent errors. If the table already exists, we don't want to attempt to create it again. Databases do not allow duplicate tables. Let's start adding columns. The first column will be the ID. Add the ID column with the following attributes. Big integer 20, not null, auto increment. The ID is going to have the big integer data type. Most importantly, the auto increment attribute must be added to the column to auto generate a value. The next column will be called description. It'll have the following attributes. Bar care 255, not null. Up next, add the amount column with the following attributes. Decimal 10, 2, not null. For the decimal data type, we must provide two values. Firstly, we must provide the size of the value. In this example, the size will be 10. Secondly, we must provide the precision, representing the number of decimal values. We're going to use 2, as most currencies have a precision of 2. The next column will be called date. It'll have the following attributes. Date, time, not null. This column has the date, time, data type. If we look at the user table, we have columns with the same data type. The main difference between these columns is the default value. For the transactions table, this column isn't going to have a default value. We're going to demand a value from the user during form submission. As stated before, this column will allow users to configure when the transaction took place. Users must provide a date. We will not set a default value. With that being said, we have two other columns with the date time data type called created at and updated at. Unlike the date column, these columns are going to have default values. Let's copy and paste these columns from the users table to the transactions table. We have one more column left. It's the user's ID. Add the user ID column. This column must have the same data type as the column it's associated with from the user's table. Otherwise, we may encounter errors. Apply the big integer data type with a size of 20. In addition, let's add the unsigned and not null attributes. We don't need to add the auto increment attributes. This column's value is going to be provided during submission. We don't need to generate a value. We're almost finished. The last step is to apply keys. Let's set the primary key to the ID column. Lastly, we must add a foreign key. We can inform our database of a value of the user ID column. A relationship can be established between the transactions and users tables. By doing so, our database can add an extra layer of security. For example, if we delete a user with transactions, our database can delete the transactions associated with an account. Alternatively, our database can prevent the deletion of a user if there are existing transactions. Relationships have many advantages. Databases can enforce rules and behaviors based on relationships between tables. Technically, we don't have to, but it'll yield a better development experience. A foreign key can be added by typing the foreign key keywords. These keywords accept the column name that will act as the foreign key. Let's set it to user ID. Next, we can add the table with the value by adding the references keyword. This keyword is followed by the table name containing the column with the value, which is users. Lastly, we must provide the column from the users table. In this example, it's the ID column. Our query is finished. Be sure to add the semicolon character at the end of the query. After confirming it's been added, let's try testing our work. Switch over to the command line. Run the composer run script phpiggy command. 
After a few moments, the command should have successfully finished running. Let's verify our table was created. In the browser, view the PHPGE database with PHP My Admin. As you can see, the transactions table was successfully created. But how do we know the relationship was established with the users table? We can use the designer tool to view the model. Our database has established a relationship as indicated by the green line. The user ID column from the transactions table is connected with the ID column from the users table. Another way to view the connection is by clicking on the cog icon from the transactions table. This button takes us to the structure of the transactions table. Below the table, a list of keys is presented. According to the tool, the user ID key has been added as a foreign key, which gives us the power to establish a relationship between two tables. After creating the table, we can proceed to work on the interface for adding data. In the next lecture, let's begin preparing the form. In this lecture, we're going to start working on the interface for transactions. Before we do, there's a concept we should wrap our heads around. In an earlier lecture, we talked about a concept called CRUD. It's short for Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. If you think about it, that's what most applications are. They're an interface for performing these actions on your data. Regardless if your database stores users, videos, or categories, most PHP applications are designed to interact with the database. They provide a layer for validation, security, and a user-friendly interface. Knowing how to develop these types of interfaces is important. That's what we'll be doing in these next set of lectures. A good starting point is to provide an interface for creating data. If you think about it, we can't update, read, or delete data without being able to create it first. I think it's a good place to start. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist. This gist contains a server code for a controller called Transaction and the template for the Create page. Let's create these files in our project. I'm going to copy the code from the controller. Next, head over to your editor. Inside the controllers directory, create a file called transactioncontroller.php. Paste the code into this file. The controller is straightforward. The controller injects an instance of the template engine class. Another method is available for rendering the create page. Next, let's create the template for the create page. In the views directory, create a folder called transactions. We don't want the views directory to become cluttered. Templates related to one another should be grouped in directories for better organization. Templates for transactions will be placed inside this folder create a file called create.php. Next, head over to the gist, grab the template code and paste it into this new file. Unlike before, you're going to notice a few things. I've decided to prepare a lot of the code for the template. It's not just plain HTML. We've already gone over most of the important concepts for templates. I don't think there's a point in repeating code. To save time, I'm going to provide more code than usual for the last set of pages. In this template, there's a form with three fields for the description, amount, and date. Below each input, we're rendering errors. In addition, each field is pre-filled with a value in case of failures. Overall, most of the code should be familiar to you. The last step is to register a route. Open the routes file. At the top of the file, import the transaction controller from the app backslash controller namespace. In our function, call the app get method. The path to the file will be slash transaction. Next, set the second argument to an array with the transaction controller class constant and create view method. This route shouldn't be accessible by guests. We're going to restrict access to this route by adding the auth require middleware class. Chain the add method to apply this middleware. Let's test our route. 
in the browser, try navigating to the slash transaction page. We are greeted with a form for creating a transaction. It's a form with three fields. If you're able to view the same page as me, you should be good to go. In the next lecture, let's begin validating the form. In this lecture, we're going to validate the form for creating transactions. We have three fields, which are a description, amount, and date. Each field is going to have unique validation rules. Let's get started. Open the routes file. Before we can validate the field, we must provide a route for handling the form submission. The route is going to be the same route for rendering the page. The main difference will be the HTTP method. Instead of a GET method, the form will be processed with a POST method. Let's make a copy of the transaction route. Change the method from GET to POST. Next, change the method from the class to CREATE. Let's define this method in our controller. Open the transaction controller. At the bottom of the class, define the create method. Validation should be performed from a service. Let's reuse the validation service we had for validating the login and registration form. We'll be repeating most of the rules. First, let's inject this service into the controller. At the top of the file, import the app backslash services backslash validation service class. Next, inside the construct method, add the validator service property. Lastly, inside our method, we're going to run a method called this validator service validate transaction with the post variable. You may be wondering, why are we passing on the post variable? Technically, the POST variable is a super global variable. Our validator shouldn't need a copy of this variable. It'll have access to it anyway. The reason is to keep our validation flexible. As you continue your programming journey, you'll soon discover that form submissions are not the only way to submit data. Another popular method of sending data is JSON. If that's the case, data won't be available via the POST super global variable. For these situations, it's better not to assume where form data can be found. Our methods should accept the form data as an argument instead of knowing where the form data is stored. In the future, we may want to swap the POST variable with another source. Let's open the validation service. At the bottom of the class, define the validate transaction method. In the parameter list, add an array parameter called form data. Inside our method, we can begin to validate the form data. Call the this validator validate method with the form data parameter. Next, pass in an array of validation rules. In this array, we're going to validate the following fields: description, amount, and date. For each of these fields, we'll apply the required rule. Keep in mind, the values for each item must be an array of rules. Currently, we're only applying one rule for each field. In the next set of lectures, we'll add additional rules. For now, let's test if our validation is working. In the browser, try viewing the page for creating a transaction. Submit the form without providing values. After doing so, each field should be throwing an error. If you're receiving errors, your form submission is working as intended. In the next lecture, let's begin adding unique validation rules for the fields starting with the description. In this lecture, we're going to validate the maximum character length for the description. The description column in the transactions table has a maximum character limit of 255 characters. If we attempt to insert a value exceeding this limit, our database will complain. We can avoid this scenario by enforcing a character limit. Let's create a custom validation rule for verifying the character limit. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist. This gist contains starter code for the rule. Copy this code to your clipboard. Next, switch over to your editor. In the framework backslash rules folder, create a file called lengthmaxrule.php. 
Paste the code into this file. The code I've provided has the basic setup for a rule. We're implementing the rule interface in the class. The only thing we have to take care of is adding the logic for both methods. First, we're going to validate the parameter. Every field is going to have a different maximum character limit. It should be customizable. For validation to be performed, we're going to require a maximum limit. Otherwise, we won't be able to perform validation. Add a conditional statement. The condition will check if the parameter was provided by using the empty function on the params0 variable. If this condition evaluates to true, let's throw an exception. At the top of the file, import the invalid argument exception class. We're already familiar with this class. We used it with the minimum rule. It's an exception defined by PHP for throwing exceptions for invalid arguments. In our conditional statement, throw an instance of this class. Let's pass in a message to help developers debug this rule. Write the following, maximum length not specified. If the condition fails, we can safely assume we have a parameter. Let's extract the parameter in a variable called length. During this step, typecast the value into an integer. Typecasting is optional, but we'll be performing a comparison with numbers. It'll be easier if we're working with a consistent data type. Next, return the following, string length data field less than length. The comparison we've written compares the length of the field's value with the length. If the value has a smaller length than the maximum length, we have a valid value. To count the characters in a string, we can use the string length function, which returns the result as a number. After adding the logic for the validate method, let's update the message. Return the following from the get message method. Exceeds maximum character limit of params zero characters. Our rule is ready. Let's try using it. Open the validator service. From the framework backslash rules namespace, import the length max rule class. Next, inside the construct method, add the rule with the add method. The alias for the rule will be called length max. Lastly, let's apply this rule to our validation for the transaction form. Scroll to the validate transaction method. In the array for the description field, add the length max rule. Set the maximum size to 255. We're ready to test our rule. Switch over to the browser. Try submitting the form with a valid description. Our field has successfully passed validation. Let's try exceeding the character limit. This time, we get an error message stating we've exceeded the character limit. Perfect! We've successfully added a rule for setting a character limit in our fields. In the next lecture, let's create a validation rule for the amount field. In this lecture, we're going to validate the amount field. This field must only contain a numeric value. The transactions table does not allow non-numeric values to be inserted into the amount column. Otherwise, an error would get thrown. To avoid this scenario, let's write a custom rule for verifying a value is numeric. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist with starter code for this rule. Copy the code to your clipboard. Next, head over to your editor. In the framework slash rules directory, create a file called numericrule.php. Paste the code into this file. Once again, we have a basic setup for a rule. Our job will be to fill in the missing blanks. Let's start with the validate method. From this method, return the following, is numeric data field. We're using a function called is numeric, which is defined by PHP. Values submitted by forms are always typecasted as strings, even if the field contains a numeric value. Luckily, the isNumeric function can validate strings too. We don't have to worry about passing in a non-numeric value into the function. The return value of this function is a boolean. 
if the value is a number, true is returned, thus successfully validating the value. Let's work on the message. From the getMessage method, return the following, only numbers allowed. We're finished with our rule. Let's try using it. Open the validator service. Import the numeric rule class from the framework backslash rules namespace. Next, scroll to the construct method. Register this rule with an alias called numeric. Afterward, let's apply this rule to our transaction form. In the validate transaction method, update the amount field by adding the numeric rule to the array. Lastly, let's test our work. In the browser, try submitting the form with a valid number in the amount field. Our rule successfully validates the field without throwing an error. By using a simple function, we've prevented users from submitting non-numeric values. In the next lecture, we're going to validate the date before moving on to inserting the transaction into the database. In this lecture, we're going to validate the date from the transaction form. Dates can be tricky to validate. Date formats come in all shapes and sizes. There isn't a single universal format. For this reason, we're going to design a rule for allowing any type of format. Let's take a look at the format for the date field. If we were to select a random date, the format would be the month, day, and year. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to easily change the format. We're forced to use the format provided by our browser. Now that we know the format, let's begin creating the rule. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist with the starter code for this rule. Copy it to your clipboard. Next, head over to your editor. Inside the framework slash rules directory, create a file called dateformatrule.php. Paste the code into this file. The rule we're going to create will check if a value follows a specific format. The format will be passed in as a parameter. The question is, how can we know a date follows the format? One solution would be to use regular expressions. That's definitely a great solution. However, I know a simpler solution. Define a variable called parsed date. The value will be a function called dateParse from format. The dateParse from format function is defined by PHP. It's a function for grabbing information related to a specific date. A custom format for the date can be specified as an argument. Here's where things get interesting. If the format for the date and the date itself don't match, this function can produce errors. We can use this opportunity to verify the date is in the correct format. Let's pass on the date and format. The first argument is the format. As mentioned before, this rule will allow developers to provide the format. Let's set this argument to the params0 variable. Next, pass in the date, which is the date field variable. The return value of this function is an array. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to this function. If you were to scroll to the examples section, you're going to find a list of possible values in the array. Looking closely, there are two useful values in the array. They're the warning count and error count items. These items contain errors related to processing the date. If these items have a value greater than zero, this means we have an error. Let's head back to our editors. Return the following from the method, parsed date error count equals 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 zero and parsed date warning count equals 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 zero. We're writing two conditions. Both conditions check if the count from both items is equal to zero. If so, the date passes validation. Otherwise, let's return a message from the get message to indicate there's an error. The message will be the following, invalid date. Let's try using our rule, open the validator service. Import the date format rule class. Next, register it with the validator instance. The alias will be called dateFormat. 
Lastly, we can apply this rule to the date field. Add the date format rule to the date field. We can use the following formats y m d. Initially, this format might seem strange. It's not the format seen in the browser. As we saw from the browser, slashes are used as separators for the month, day, and year. Behind the scenes, browsers modify the format to use dashes instead of slashes during form submissions. That can be a gotcha, so watch out for it when working with date inputs. If our date follows this format, it'll pass the test. Let's test our rule. In the browser, try submitting the form with a valid date. After submitting the form, our date gets validated. Perfect! We have a date validator that can accept any format. We're finished with validating the transaction form. It's time to start inserting the values into the database upon passing validation. In the next lecture, let's begin updating our database. In this lecture, we're going to begin inserting a new transaction into our database with the form data from the transaction page. This logic is going to be outsourced into a service. At the moment, we don't have a service for transactions. Let's create one. In the services directory, create a file called transactionservice.php. Set the namespace to app backslash services. Next, define a class called transaction service. Our service is going to be responsible for inserting a user into the database. Database interaction requires a connection. Our container can provide this information via injection. Let's inject the database class into our service. At the top of the file, import the database class. Next, inside the class, add the construct method. Add the database class as a dependency as a property called db. Great! We can start querying the database. Define a method called create. This method is going to accept the form data as an argument. Add this parameter with the array data type. Inside this method, we can begin querying the database. Call the thisDB query method. Let's pass in the following query. Insert into transactions user ID description amount date values user ID description amount date. We're writing a standard insert query. There are four columns we're going to set, which are the user's ID, description, amount, and date. Placeholders are being inserted into the query. We're working with user data. To avoid SQL injection, prepared statements prevent users from inserting malicious data. Let's pass in an array as the second argument to the query method. First, we must provide the user ID. As a reminder, the transactions table has a relationship with the users table. We must provide a valid ID from the user. This ID can be stored in the user ID column. Luckily, this information is available via a session. Set the user ID placeholder to the session user variable. Next, set the description placeholder to the form data description variable. Afterward, set the amount placeholder to the form data amount variable. We have one more column, which is the date. Before adding the date, there's one problem we must address. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the date time data type for MariaDB. The date time data type was introduced for inserting a date into the database. If we read the description, we're given a specific format for the date. According to the documentation, the format is the year, month, day, hour, minute, and seconds. The date submitted with the form only contains the first portion of this format. The time is not provided with the submission. If we were to insert the date alone, our database may attempt to fill in the time with the current time. That's not exactly desirable. Instead of allowing a default time, let's reset the time to midnight. We don't really care about the time. It's fine for all transactions to have the same time. 
Let's head back to our editors. Above the query, define a variable called formatted date with the following value: form data date 00 colon 00 colon 00. We're using string interpolation to generate a proper format. Make sure the date and time are separated with a space. After creating the formatted date, let's set the date placeholder to the formatted date variable. We're finished with our query. The last step is to invoke this method from our controller. First, the service must be injectable. Open the container definitions file. Let's import the transaction service class from the app backslash services namespace. Next, add the transaction service class constant to the array. Set the value to a regular anonymous function. We're using an anonymous function to write multiple lines of code. Similar to the user service, we're going to need an instance of the database. To grab access to this service, we'll need to accept the container instance as an argument to the function. Inside the function, define a variable called db. Its value will be the container get database class method. After grabbing the database, we can return an instance of the transaction service class with the db instance. We can start injecting this service into our controller. Open the transaction controller. Import the transaction service class. Inside the construct method, we're going to inject the service as a property called transaction service. Lastly, inside the create method, call the this transaction service create method with the post variable. After the user has submitted a form successfully, let's redirect them to the home page by calling the redirect to function. That should do it. It's time to test our form. Switch over to the browser. First, let's test validation by submitting invalid data. The errors are working as intended. Let's try submitting the form with valid data. Everything works this time. We're taken to the home page to view a list of transactions. This page is not fully functional. We'll be adjusting it in a future lecture. Let's confirm the transaction was inserted by viewing the transactions table with phpMyAdmin. As you can see, a new record was inserted into our table. Alright, in the next lecture, let's work on updating this page to properly display the list of transactions. In this lecture, we're going to retrieve the transactions from the database. We've successfully inserted the transaction into the transactions table. The next step is to render the list of transactions to the user. This information will be rendered on the home page. On the home page, we're going to render the description, amount, receipts, date, and a series of actions. Receipts are a feature we haven't discussed yet. This column is going to remain empty for most of the section. I promise we'll revisit it in the next section. Let's get started. In your editor, open the database file. If we look through our class, we have one problem. We don't have a method for grabbing multiple records. Behind the scenes, the find method calls the fetch method from the statement property. However, the fetch method only returns a single result. For the home page, multiple transactions must be displayed. Let's create a method for grabbing multiple results from a query. At the bottom of the class, define a method called FindAll. Inside this method, return the value from the ThisStatement FetchAll method. The FetchAll method is available on the PDO statement class to return an array of results from a query. Let's try using this method from our transaction service. The logic for grabbing a list of transactions is going to be outsourced to our service. Not required, but it'll keep our controller slim. Let's define a method called getUserTransactions. As the name implies, we're going to grab transactions submitted by the user. 
we shouldn't grab all transactions. Otherwise, users would have access to transactions uploaded by other users. This would be a huge privacy concern. To make it absolutely clear, we're grabbing users' transactions. The name reflects the action. Inside this method, let's begin writing the query. Define a variable called transactions. The value will be the thisDB query method. Write the following query. Select asterisk from transactions where user ID equals user ID. The WHERE clause filters the results based on the user ID. Let's pass in an array to replace the placeholder from our query. Set the user ID placeholder to the session user variable. After performing the query, let's immediately grab the results by chaining the find all method. Lastly, let's return the transactions variable. Our method is ready. Let's try using our service from the home controller. Unlike the other pages related to transactions, the home controller is going to be responsible for rendering a list of transactions. Alternatively, we could move the method from the home controller to the transaction controller. However, to save time, we'll leave the logic for rendering the list of transactions in the home controller. At the top of the file, import the transaction service class. Inside the construct method, inject the class as a property called transaction service. Scroll to the home method. Let's grab the transactions before rendering the template. Define a variable called transactions set to the this transaction service get user transactions method. Lastly, pass in an array to the render method. We can pass on template data via the second argument. In the array, let's add a template variable called transactions. Its value will be the transactions variable. Now that we are passing on the transactions to our template, we can start rendering the data. Open the index template. In this template, search for an HTML comment that says transaction table body. In this element, we have a few table row elements. These elements render dummy content. They're no longer necessary. I'm going to remove these elements while leaving a single copy alone. Next, we're able to wrap the single table row element with a for each block. The expression will be the following, transactions as transaction. Afterward, let's render the transaction information in the row. I've provided comments to help you understand the structure of the table. The first column must render the description. Replace the static text with an echo statement. Echo the transaction description variable with the escape function. In the second column, echo the transaction amount variable. Next, in the fourth column, echo the transaction date variable. We're going to skip the third and fifth columns. They'll be dealt with in a later lecture. After echoing those values, let's try viewing the home page. Before this lecture started, I added a few transactions. I recommend doing the same. As you can see, the home page is able to successfully render the transactions for a specific user. It's working as intended. However, we're not finished yet. There are additional features I want to add, such as formatting, searching, and pagination. In the next set of lectures, we're going to tackle each of these features. In this lecture, we're going to format the date for readability. On the home page, we're rendering the list of transactions. I'm not happy with the formatting of the date. It feels cluttered with information. I don't think it's necessary for the date to contain the time. Let's format the date to only display the year, month, and day. There are two solutions at our disposal. The first solution is to use the date time class from PHP. While that works, there is an alternative solution I want to show. It's completely possible to use SQL to format values before returning the results. In the resource section of this lecture, 
I provide a link to a function called DateFormat. The DateFormat function can be used for modifying the date with the DateTime data type. If you scroll through the page, you'll find placeholders for producing a new date. Feel free to create a custom date after finishing this lecture. For our case, we're going to render the year, month, and day. Let's get started. In your editor, open the Transaction Service class. Scroll to the Get User Transactions method. In this method, let's modify the query by adding the following after the asterisk character. Comma, date, format date, percent y, dash, percent m, dash, percent d as formatted date. A few things worth noting about this modification. Firstly, the results returned by the query must be specified after the SELECT statement. By adding the asterisk character, we're instructing the database to return values from all columns. However, we're not limited to values from columns. It's completely acceptable to generate additional values. Additional values can be comma separated. In this example, we're using the date format function to generate a new value with each result. It has two arguments. Firstly, we must provide the column name from the current table with the date. We're passing on the date column. Secondly, we must provide the new format. We're formatting the date by year, month, and day. The last portion of the query adds the as keyword. As mentioned before, we're generating a new value. Therefore, we must provide an alias or name for the value by using the as keyword. This keyword is followed by the name of the value. We'll be able to reference the new date by this name. After updating the query, let's update our template. Open the index template. Search for a comment that says date from the loop. Let's update the echo statement to output the formatted date variable instead of the date variable. In the browser, refresh the page. After modifying the query, we've got a formatted date. There really isn't an advantage to using the date format function over PHP. It's just a different solution. Feel free to use the date time class to format the date. Oftentimes, developers reach for PHP to perform formatting. However, databases offer convenient functions to perform these types of actions. In the next lecture, Let's work on adding a search feature. In this lecture, we're going to work on the form for the transactions page. On this page, we have a simple form for searching through the list of transactions. Users can have hundreds of transactions, but they may be interested in a specific transaction. Hence why we have a form for filtering the transactions. I want to add the ability to search through transactions. Before writing a solution, Let's understand how other sites implement a search feature. On YouTube, if you were to search for videos, the URL in your address bar would change. I've searched for videos related to pizza. Looking closely, the search term is stored in the URL. Let's look at another example. Udemy also has a search feature. I may want to take a course on Python. Once again, the search term is stored in the URL. But why do sites use the URL for storing the search term? It's because most programming languages allow you to parse the URL. This means you can grab values from the URL, including the search term. After grabbing the search term, you can use it to query your database. This feature is called Query Parameters. Query parameters are extremely powerful. We can add query parameters to our routes to filter and sort through data on a page. But, what is a query parameter? The structure of a URL consists of a domain and path. There's one additional piece of the URL that is completely optional, called the query string. We can attach data to the URL through a query string. The server will accept this data. Developers will use query strings to filter and sort through data. The format for a query is simple. Query strings always begin with a question mark symbol. The question mark symbol denotes the beginning of a query parameter. Query parameters are key value pairs. If you would like to add additional query parameters, they can be separated with an ampersand character. In this example, there are two query parameters. 
The first parameter is called id with a value of 1 and the second parameter is called foo with a value of bar. Query parameters are used by major companies like YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. For example, if you perform a search on YouTube, you'll be able to refresh the page without performing the search again. The same results get rendered. YouTube uses query parameters to store the search parameters. We can do something similar for our transactions. Let's see how we can create a query parameter. In your editor, open the index.php template. In this template, search for an HTML comment that says Search Form. There are two steps for adding query parameters. Firstly, we must have a form with the method set to get. If we set the method attribute to get, data from inputs get stored in the URL as query parameters. Browsers automatically handle formatting values on our behalf. The second step is to assign a name to our input fields. The names are used for referencing specific values from within a query parameter. I've already taken care of configuring these settings for you. Let's try testing our form. Switch back to the browser. Inside the form, I'm going to type a random text and submit the form. The page gets refreshed. You'll notice two things. Firstly, the same page gets rendered. Despite having a different URL than the pattern in the route registration, our framework was able to render the correct page. This is because query parameters are ignored from the pattern. In the address bar, the query parameter has been added. Perfect! We're able to load the same page while submitting data to it. There's one additional thing you'll notice. The query parameter name is set to S. Throughout this course, I've put a large emphasis on using concise and descriptive variable names. This name breaks that convention. There's a good reason for this naming convention. URLs can't store a lot of data. To optimize space, it's recommended to use query parameters that are short. In this case, we're using the letter S to represent the search term. It's a common practice you'll see in most applications. Now that we have the query parameter storing the user's search term, let's grab it. Open the Transaction Service. Scroll to the Get User Transactions method. In this method, define a variable called search term set to the dollar sign underscore get s variable. Query parameters are stored in a super global variable called get. PHP handles formatting the values into an associative array. We can reference a specific parameter by its name, just in case. It's possible the form was not submitted. Therefore, this key would not exist. Let's use the null coalescing operator to set a default value of an empty string. Let's echo the search term variable to view the results. Next, refresh the page. As you can see, our term gets rendered on the page. We're able to successfully retrieve the query parameter in our service. In the next lecture, Let's use this information to search for records in our database. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to use a feature in SQL called the Like Clause. Throughout most of this course, we've been searching our database for specific values. That's not always going to be the case. Sometimes, you might want to retrieve multiple results based on a word. Searching through a database is a common task you'll need to perform. Databases have basic support for searching through a table based on a term called the like condition. Let's look at how it can be performed as a raw SQL query. Before getting started, I recommend submitting a few transactions. It's going to help you test this feature. At the moment, I'm looking at my database in PHP My Admin. I'm going to click on the SQL tab to perform a custom query. In the query box, type the following. Select asterisk from transactions where description equals e. The query I've written searches the description column for a value equal to e. If I were to submit this query, the database would not return results. This is because the database is performing an exact match. The value for the description column must be e. That's not what we want. 
What if we want results that start with E or end with E? We may not always know the exact value. In these cases, we can modify our query for a partial match by changing the equal sign into the like keyword. This keyword allows for partial matching instead of exact matching. However, we must tell the database the position of the partial match by using the percent symbol. If we add this symbol to the end of the string, we are telling our database to partially match strings beginning with this letter, vice versa. Adding it to the beginning of the string allows for partial matches ending with this character. Lastly, it's completely possible to have both solutions by adding the symbol on both sides. Let's add them to both sides of the string. Next, let's execute the query. As you can see, a few results appear despite not having exact matches. The like clause is a quick and dirty solution for adding search columns in your database. With that being said, there's one thing I want to mention. The like condition is not always reliable. You may have missing results from your table. It's not fast, nor is it accurate. In a real project, you might have to use a different solution for an advanced search feature. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a product called Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a popular product for adding search features to your database. We didn't use it because it would take a lot of time to set up. We're getting short on time, so I went with the like keyword. However, if you desperately need a better search engine, you might want to consider using this product. In the next lecture, let's use this feature to help us search for transactions in our application. In this lecture, we're going to filter the transactions based on the search term. This process is going to involve creating a custom query. Let me show you what I mean. In your editor, open the transaction service. Previously, we echoed the search term variable. Let's remove this line of code. Next, we must update our query to use the like clause. Add the following to the end of the query. And description like description. We're using a placeholder since the search term will be injected into the query. To prevent SQL injections, we're going to replace this placeholder by preparing it. In the array of the second arguments, update it by adding the description placeholder. Set the item to the following, percent, search term, percent. We're finished with our query. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, refresh the page. By default, if we haven't searched for anything, the page should display all results. Next, let's try inputting a search for one of the transactions. As you can see, our search feature is working as intended. Like I said before, it's not going to be perfect. You may find that it doesn't completely produce the most reliable results. For our purposes, it'll do. In the next lecture, Let's make a simple improvement to this feature before moving on to the next portion of the page. In this lecture, we're going to make a small adjustment to our query for searching through transactions. In my list of transactions, I have a transaction with the percent symbol in the description. What do you think will happen if I try searching for a description with this symbol? Let's find out. As you can see, nothing gets found. This is because the percent symbol doesn't get treated as part of the search query. Since the percent symbol gets treated differently than other characters, SQL interprets this symbol differently. Like most things, we should escape our search term so that it gets treated as a regular character. In your editor, open the transaction service. Scroll to the get user transactions method. In this method, we should escape the search term variable before performing the query. PHP provides a function for escaping custom characters in a string. Let's wrap this part of the expression with a function called add c slashes. This function has two arguments. The first argument is the value to escape. As for the second argument, it's a list of characters that should be escaped. Let's pass in two characters, which are the percent and underscore characters. We're including the underscore character since this character can also be used in the like condition. It's a good idea to escape it as well. Let's try testing our work. 
switch over to the browser and refresh the page. As you can see, the database was able to find the transaction with this character. This is an edge case, but something to be aware of in our application. You may need to perform searches with special characters, which can be interpreted differently in your queries. It's always a good idea to escape your characters. In the next lecture, we're going to start working on pagination. In this lecture, we're going to talk about another feature of SQL called the Limit Clause. Our goal is to start paginating the result of our transactions. Our users can have hundreds of transactions, even thousands. So far, we've been performing queries grabbing one record or the entire table of records. That can work for some pages, but not all pages. In some cases, grabbing a limited set of results is preferable for performance and user experience. It's common practice to split results into pages. This feature is called pagination. We can perform pagination with the help of our database by using the Limit Clause. Let's look at how we can perform pagination. I'm looking at the SQL tab for performing a query. I'll write the following query. Select asterisk from transactions. After performing this query, a complete list of results from the transactions table is returned. We can add to this query by using the Limit Clause. This clause must always be added at the end of the query. This clause allows developers to limit the results. After this keyword, we must provide the limit. Let's set the limit to 5. After setting the limit, let's execute the query again. This time, only 5 results were returned. Pretty simple, right? We can take things a step further by adding an offset. If you were to repeatedly run the same query, you'll notice the results are always in the same order. By default, tables sort results by the primary key in ascending order. What if we don't want to always start from the first result? We may want to start from the fifth result. That's possible by modifying our query. After the number in the limit clause, we can add a comma followed by an offset. Let's set the offset to 5 and execute the query. After making those changes, the sixth result has become the first result. You can probably imagine how this feature can help us perform pagination. We can use the Limit Clause to change the results displayed in our table. If the user navigates to the next page, we'll update the offset to display the next set of results. In the next lecture, let's start applying this clause to our query for the Transactions page. In this lecture, we're going to start paginating our application. Similar to the search form, we're going to be using a query parameter to store the page number. Query parameters are stored in the browser's history. By using a query parameter, users will be able to go back and forth between pages through their history. Let's get started by opening the controller. In the home method, we outsourced the query to the service. For this demonstration, some of the data will be defined from the controller. But why? Shouldn't the controller remain thin? In most cases, yes. However, we're going to need this data for the template. Therefore, it'll be beneficial to write the logic from the controller. Whenever possible, we'll try our best to outsource a majority of the logic to the service. Only data necessary for the controller should be defined in this method. At the moment, the query grabs all transactions from our table. We can update the query to limit the results. First, let's prepare some variables. As mentioned before, we're going to be using a query parameter. To find a variable called page set to the following expression, get p null coalescing operator 1. We're going to store the page number in a query parameter called p. It's possible this query parameter does not exist on every request. In that case, we're going to set the default value to 1 to grab results related to the first page. Afterward, let's cast the page variable into an integer. Since the value is exposed in the address bar, it's possible to manipulate this variable into a value other than a number. As an extra precaution, casting the value into an integer will help us make sure we're working with a number. Next, define a variable called length with a value of 3. 
the length variable is going to store the number of results that can be queried per page. Typically, you would provide an option on the page to configure this option. However, for this demonstration, we're going to hard code the value into our script. If you want, you can add this option to our page as an exercise. Lastly, let's define one more variable called offset. Its value will be the following, page minus one asterisk length. We're multiplying the page by the length to calculate the offset. Before multiplying these values, I'm decrementing the page variable by one. As a reminder, most programming languages start at zero, not one. So, why are we setting the page variable to one as the default value? It's for a user-friendly experience. Most users are used to seeing one as the first page, not zero. All right, our variables are ready. Let's apply them to our query. First, we must pass on these variables to our service. Pass on the length and offset variables. The next step is to update the service to accept this information. Open the transaction service. Inside the parameter list of the getUserTransactions method, add both parameters. Both parameters are going to have the integer data type. Next, update the query by adding the following to the end of the string. Limit length offset offset. As we learned previously, we can add the offset by adding a comma after the limit. The offset keyword is an alternative solution. There isn't a difference between the two. You can use the shorthand version, but this keyword can give extra clarity to your team, who may not be familiar with SQL. Either solution is fine. In addition, we're inserting the values into the string. In most cases, we would prepare the values. However, they're not values provided by the user. It's not necessary to prepare them as they're hard-coded into our application. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, refresh the page. Only three results are going to appear on the page. We're using a really low number. Practically, you would want to use a higher number, like 25. The reason we're using a low number is because we don't have many transactions on our site. It's easier to test pagination with a low length. Next, let's try testing pagination by adding a query parameter. In the address bar, add a parameter called p set to 2. Upon entering this address, a new set of results are produced. Awesome! Our pagination is working as expected. The only thing left to do is to update our UI to render links for navigating between pages. In the next lecture, let's begin this process. In this lecture, we're going to start updating the transactions, templates, pagination links. First, we're going to start with the previous link. It's the easiest link to work with, but it'll give us an idea of how we'll be doing pagination. Let's take a moment to think about this. The previous link should only appear when the user is on a page higher than one. If they're on the first page of results, it doesn't make sense to render this link. So. Our template's going to need the current page. We have this information from our controller. The next step becomes obvious. We should pass it on from the controller to the template. In your editor, open the home controller. In the home method, we're going to update the render method. The array we're passing in only has the transactions. Let's add a new item called current page set to the page variable. There's one more piece of information I want to provide. The link should take users to the previous page. But what if the user searches for a term? They may want to return to a previous page of their results. Let's build a query parameter to include the search term and page. First, we must grab the search term. Below our other variables, define a variable called search term with the following value get s nullish coalescing operator null. In this example, we're using null as a default value. If the user isn't performing a search, there isn't a point in including this parameter. Next, let's build the query. In the array of the second argument of the render method, add an item called previous page query. 
set it to a function called HTTP build query. We're already familiar with this function. We used it to help us build a DNS string for connecting to our database. This function was originally introduced for building HTTP query parameters. It's perfect for our scenario. Pass in an array. In this array, set the p parameter to the page minus 1 variable. Next, add the s parameter. Its value will be the search term variable. If an item in an array has a null value, the HTTP build query function ignores the value, which is perfect. We don't want to include it when the user isn't performing a search. Previously, we added a value for the separator. By default, the separator is an ampersand character. It's not necessary to include it. We can start updating our template to use these variables. Let's open the index.php template for the transactions page. In this template, search for an HTML comment that says previous page link. Let's wrap the anchor element with an if tag. The condition will be the following, current page greater than 1. If the current page is greater than 1, we can safely render the link. The last step is to update the href attribute to point to the previous page. Update it to the following. That's it. Let's try testing our work. Refresh the home page in the browser. As you can see, the link has disappeared, which is exactly what we wanted since we're on the first page. I'm going to update the URL to set the page query to 2. After doing so, the previous link appears because we're on a page greater than 1. If I click on the previous link, I'm taken back to the first page, and the link disappears. Perfect! This entire process is nothing new to us, but it should give you an idea of how we'll render pagination links. In the next lecture, we're going to work on the other links, which will require a bit more work. In this lecture, we're going to work on the next link. This link takes users to the next page. However, we shouldn't always render this link. It should only be available if the next page has results. Typically, pagination is implemented by counting the total number of results. In our service, we aren't grabbing the total results. We must create an additional query to grab this information. The second query should be similar to our current query, with the exception of limits. Let's give it a try. In your editor, open the transaction service. First, let's extract the parameters passed into the second argument of the query method. We're going to be duplicating the query with the same information. To reduce repetitive code, it would be a good idea to outsource this array into a dedicated variable. Cut this array from the method. Next, at the top of the method, define a variable called parameters. Its value will be the array. Lastly, pass in the params variable into the query method. Let's work on the second query. Below the first query, define a variable called transaction count. The value will be the thisDB query method. The query is going to be a copy of the first query. Let's grab it. A few adjustments are going to be made. Firstly, remove the limit and offset keywords. We're not interested in counting the results for a specific page. We want to count the entire set of results. Next, change the SELECT keyword to count the results by using the COUNT asterisk function. For the second argument, pass in the params variable. After the query, let's grab the results by chaining the count method. Now that we have the total number of results, let's return it from this method. However, we're already returning the transactions variable. In that case, let's wrap the return value with an array. By using an array, we'll be able to return multiple values. Add the transaction count variable to the array. 
Let's update the home controller to grab these results. Open the home controller file. Inside the home method, we're calling the get user transactions method. Since this method is returning an array of results, let's destructure the array. It'll be easier to identify our variables if we outsource them into separate variables. Wrap the transactions variable with square brackets. The first item in the array will be the transactions. The second item will be the total count. Let's set the second item to a variable called count. With this information, we can calculate the last page. Our original goal was to only render a link if the next page has results. Therefore, we need to know what's the last possible page. We can calculate this value. Define another variable called last page. Its value will be the following, total count slash length. We're dividing the total number of results by the number of results per page. We might get a float. Since page numbers are typically whole numbers, let's surround this value with a function called seal. The seal function rounds a number to a whole number. It'll always round the value up. Let's inject this variable into the template. In the array of the render method, add the last page variable as an item. Next, we're going to build an HTTP query. The purpose of this query string will be for the next link. It's going to be similar to the previous page link. Add an item called next page query. Set this item to the HTTP build query function. Add an item called p set to p plus 1. Next, add an item for the search term variable called s. With this information, we can render the next link. Open the index.php template for the transactions feature. In this template, search for an HTML comment that says next page link. Let's wrap the anchor element with an if tag. The condition will be the following, current page less than last page. If the current page is less than the last page, the user can move on to the next page. Let's update the href attribute to the following, slash, question mark, echo, next page query. Let's try testing our work. Refresh the transactions page. The next link appears on the page. We can click on this link and be taken to the next page. I can click back and forth between pages. If I arrive at the last page, the next link disappears. This behavior indicates we're on the last page. That's exactly what we were looking for. In the next lecture, let's finish our pagination feature by working on the links for specific pages. In this lecture, we're going to work on the links for specific pages in our pagination. These links are going to contain query parameters for the search term and page number. Similar to the other links, let's build the query parameter. In your editor, open the home controller. Unlike before, we're going to create an array of page queries. Since we'll have multiple links, we'll need multiple query parameters for each page. Below the last page variable, define a variable called page links. Its value will be the array map function. The array map function was created for looping through an array. Unlike other loop features, we must return a value from each iteration of the loop. The new values are stored in a new array. The overall array is returned from this function. Here's the thing. We don't have an array to loop through. We're interested in creating a loop for every page. All we have is the last page variable, which represents the total number of pages. Luckily, we can generate an array with the total number of pages. Let's generate an array of page numbers. Define a variable called pages. Set the value to the following, last page question mark range. Let's set the else case to an empty array. Otherwise, a range of numbers can be set by passing in a minimum and maximum value. All pages start at 1, 
so we'll pass in 1 as the starting page number. Next, we must provide the maximum value, which will be the last page variable. We've created an array of page numbers. However, we want HTTP query parameters for the links. The numbers aren't the only thing we'll need. Let's loop through this variable to generate the query. Define a variable called PageLink. Set it to the ArrayMap function. For the second argument of the ArrayMap function, pass in a variable called Pages. Now that we have an array of numbers, we can loop through them to generate a page query. In the first argument, pass in an arrow function. This function is passed in each number. Let's accept the number as a variable called PageNum. From this function, pass in an array. The array will contain the page number and search term. Set the P parameter to page num and the S parameter to the search term variable. Lastly, let's pass on these values to our templates. In the render method, add an item to the array called page links set to the page links variable. While we're here, let's pass on the search term variable. On our page, we have a search form. If a user performs a search, their search term should appear in the input. We forgot to do so from an earlier lecture. Let's pre-fill the input as we work on the page links. Open the index.php template for transactions. Search for the form element. On the input element, add the value attribute. In this attribute, Echo the search term variable with the escape function. This expression may produce an error. The escape function only accepts strings. If we attempt to pass in a non-string value, the function may not work properly. The search term variable may be null. If that's the case, let's typecast the variable to the string type. That should fix any potential issues. Let's move on to the links. In this template, search for a comment that says page links. Under this comment, there is going to be an anchor element. Wrap this element with a for each tag. To generate links for pages, we must perform a loop. The expression for this loop will be the following, page links as page num query. We're looping through our array of page links. In addition, we're grabbing the key of each item as a variable called page num. The links are going to render the page number as the text for the link. This is why we're grabbing the key. Let's update the link to output the number. Replace the static text with the page num plus one variable. We're adding one to the variable since arrays start at zero. It would be awkward if our page number started at 0. Typically, users expect the first page to start at 1. Next, set the href attribute to the following value, slash, question mark, echo, query. There's one more step. If the link being rendered is the current page, we should change the color of the link. Below this loop, there's another comment. I provided the classes necessary for changing the link's appearance. The current classes are for changing the link when it's active. The default classes are for when the link is not active. Let's apply these classes. At the beginning of the class attribute, add an expression. It'll contain the following value. Page num plus one equals 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 current page question mark colon. If the condition evaluates to true, let's render the classes from the current list. Otherwise, let's render the classes from the default list. There are going to be duplicate classes from the original class list. From the original list of classes, remove the border transparent, text gray 500, Hover Text Gray 700 and Hover Border Gray 300 classes. 
After making those changes, we can test our work. Refresh the home page. Below the table, our pagination links are working. We can click on them to change the page. The active link also changes its appearance as we navigate around the pages. With that finished, we've completed the home page, at least for now. We can start moving on to editing and deleting transactions. In the next few lectures, we'll handle that process. In this lecture, we're going to start working on the route for editing a transaction. So far, we've created routes for creating and retrieving transactions. We're halfway through implementing a CRUD interface. The next step is to update a transaction. Users may want to edit their transactions after creating them. We should provide them with an option to do so. Let's get started. In your editor, open the routes file. Inside the register route function, call the get method. The path will be the following, slash transaction, slash transaction. Unlike other routes, this route is going to contain route parameters. Every route has been static. They have never contained a dynamic value. This time, things are going to be different. Our application can have thousands of transactions. Our router should be able to render any transaction. The question is, how? It's common practice to store IDs in URLs. In our case, we're going to store the transaction ID. In our path, we're using a placeholder. There isn't an official syntax for adding placeholders to URLs. As far as the browser is concerned, this segment is interpreted as is. Our router is going to be responsible for treating this path segment as a placeholder. Placeholders are going to be written with curly brackets. Inside these brackets, we'll provide a name. In addition to storing the ID, we're going to extract the ID from the URL. By doing so, we'll be able to grab a record from our database based on the ID. This feature is known as route parameters. Currently, our router doesn't support route parameters. We'll be updating it in a future lecture. For now, let's continue working on the route. In the second argument, pass in an array. If this route is visited, we'll run a method called EditView from the Transaction Controller class. Next, let's define this method. Open the Transaction Controller. At the bottom of the class, define the EditView method. Before rendering a template, I want to verify the method receives the route parameters. During the dispatch process, we'll pass on route parameters to our methods as an argument. Let's accept this information as an array called parameters. Inside our method, we'll dump the contents of this array. Currently, this line of code will not work because our router is not passing on this information. Don't worry. We'll add the logic from our router to pass on this information in an upcoming lecture. One more thing before testing our work. Let's update the links on the home page to visit a page for editing a transaction. Currently, the user doesn't have a way to edit a transaction. Open the index.php template file. In the template, search for an HTML comment that says Actions. In this table data cell, we have a few links. The second link is responsible for taking the user to edit a transaction. Let's update the href attribute to the following value, echo e transaction id. Time to test our work. In the browser, refresh the home page. If you hover your mouse over the links for editing a transaction, the links should be transaction slash followed by the ID of the transaction. Upon clicking on the link, we're taken to a blank page. This is because our router doesn't support route parameters. In the next lecture, we'll add support for this feature. Before moving on, there's one question I want to address. Instead of using route parameters, we could have used query parameters. So. Why are we using query parameters? We have two options for storing dynamic values in our URLs. The first is by using query parameters. 
I'm showing a very simplified example of what a transaction URL would look like. We're using the ID to generate a unique URL. Storing the value in a query parameter is one way to go about it. In the second example, I'm using a path parameter. Rather than storing the ID in a query parameter, we could store the search term in a path segment. It's a common feature in most routers. In addition, it looks cleaner compared to query parameters. The question is, why is using path parameters a more viable option than query parameters? Technically, either solution works. Search engines won't have a problem with indexing our site if we use query parameters. It's not so much about errors, but what is considered good practice. The general rule of thumb is the following. Path parameters are used to filter or sort through data and resources. For sorting transactions, using query parameters made sense because we were sorting the transactions on the page. For a single transaction, using a path parameter would make sense because we're retrieving a single resource. By following this practice, you can achieve a more organized route structure. It's a pattern you'll see in most applications. Not every company uses this pattern for one reason or another. Older apps may have adopted a different pattern because the pattern I mentioned is still relatively new. Determining which to use will come with experience. We'll leave it here. Let's continue our work in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to replace the placeholder with a regular expression. Our router must provide support for route parameters. Route parameters are written with curly brackets. The goal is to replace these placeholders with regular expressions. By doing so, we'll be able to extract the value in a URL. In order to perform this action, we must detect placeholders in our paths. Detecting placeholders can also be performed with regular expression. Let's use the regular expression 101 tool again. If you lost the link to this tool, check out the resource section of this lecture for a link. In the test string box, let's add our route as an example. Type the following slash transaction slash transaction slash. The first regular expression we'll write is to detect a placeholder in a path. First, let's change the delimiter to hash characters. In the regular expression field, add a pair of curly brackets. The first step is to search for opening and closing curly brackets. If we were to remove the route parameter name, the regular expression would be able to find them. However, that's not exactly what we want. Our route parameters are going to have names. Names can be anything a developer wants. In that case, our expression should be able to select the entire segment from the beginning of the curly bracket to the closing curly bracket. Inside these curly brackets, add a pair of square brackets. We've talked about square brackets before. They're used to select a range of characters. We want to be able to select any character between the curly brackets with one exception. We don't want to select characters with the forward slash character. This character indicates a new path segment. We only want to select characters in the current path segment. Add this character to the square brackets. If we look at the explanation, the tool states the expression will select this character. Its effect is the opposite of what we want. At the beginning of the square brackets, add the caret character. The caret character changes the behavior of the square brackets. This character instructs the regular expression not to select the characters in this range. Taking a look at the explanation, the description has slightly changed. It's stating that any characters in this range are not matched, which is what we want. The last step is to select multiple characters. As we know, regular expressions only select a single character. Our expression must be able to select all characters inside a pair of curly brackets. After the square brackets, add the plus character. If we look at the results, the transaction placeholder has been selected. We've successfully written a regular expression for selecting placeholders. Let's try using it in our framework. Copy the expression to the clipboard. Next, open the router file in your editor. 
we're going to update the add method. Before inserting a record into the routes array, we'll update the path by creating a variable called regexpath. The value will be a function called pregreplace. The pregreplace function performs a regular expression on a string. On top of searching for a value, it'll replace the match with any value we'd like. Once again, we're going to replace the path passed into the router with a regular expression. By doing so, we'll be able to extract values from the path. The first argument to this function is the regular expression. Let's pass in our custom regular expression. Next, we must provide the value we'd like to use as a replacement. The replacement value will be the regular expression without the hash and curly bracket characters. Surround the expression with a pair of parentheses. Keep in mind, we're going to allow for paths to support multiple parameters. If that's the case, we'll need to extract multiple values from a single path. We're using the same expression with parentheses instead of curly brackets. Parentheses create a group. It's not uncommon for regular expressions to select multiple values. By adding these characters, we'll be able to select multiple values from a single string. The last argument to this function is the string to perform the regular expression on. Pass in the path variable. Afterward, let's add this new path to the record. In the array, add an item called regexpath set to the regexpath variable. Lastly, let's use our regular expression inside the dispatch method. If you scroll to this method, there is a conditional statement to check the current path with a regular expression. Let's replace the variable in the first argument of the preg match function with the route regexpath variable. After making those changes, we can try testing our work. In the browser, try visiting the page to edit a transaction. Our application throws an error. Looking closely, the error states the EditView method does not provide an array called parameters. That's great. Well, not really. Ideally, this route should render a form. However, our router is able to find a route matching the URL path. Previously, we would receive a blank page because our router couldn't find a match. Now that it's able to find a match, we'll be able to render a method. As long as you get a similar error, you're good to go. In the next lecture, let's extract the values from the path and pass it onto our controller's method. In this lecture, we're going to extract the route parameter values. At the moment, our router is able to select a route with a route parameter our controller is going to need the parameter values. Otherwise, we won't be able to render a form pre-filled with the existing values. That's going to be our objective for this lecture. In your editor, open the router file. Grabbing the values is easy. In the dispatch method, we're using the preg match function to search for matches. The regular expression we've written has support for groups. Groups are a way to grab multiple values from a regular expression. The group can be retrieved by passing in a variable to the third argument of the preg match function. Hover your mouse over this function. The argument is a variable that can be passed in as a reference. If we pass in a variable, the preg match function will update the variable to an array of values found in the regular expression. Let's pass in a variable called parameter values. This variable doesn't exist, but that's perfectly fine. Parameters marked as references will create the variable, which will then be accessible in our method. After the conditional statement, let's dump the parameter values variable. Then, refresh the page. As you can see, we have an array of matches. However, there's one problem. The first item in the array is the entire path, which isn't necessary. We're only interested in the route parameter values. Let's head back to our editors. Before dumping the array, run the array shift function. This function can remove the first item in an array. It has one argument, which is the array. Pass in the parameter values array. The full path will always be the first item in the array. We can safely assume it can be removed. 
in the browser, refresh the page. This time, we're only given our values. If we have a route with multiple parameters, we won't be able to identify which value belongs to which parameter. Let's update this array to be an associative array. The key name will be the placeholder name instead of a numeric value. Head back to the editor. First, we must extract the placeholders without the curly brackets. Run a function called pregmatchAll. I'm introducing a new function called pregmatchAll. It's similar to the pregmatch function with one exception. The pregmatch function only returns a single result upon finding a match. The pregmatchAll function returns all possible results. Since we can have multiple placeholders, we want to be able to grab all of them. Aside from that, the arguments are the same. Let's reuse the expression from before. In the add method, grab the regular expression for the pregreplace function. Paste it as the value for the pregmatchAll function. We're going to make one adjustment, which is to wrap the inner expression with a pair of parentheses. As a reminder, this regular expression will grab placeholders from the original path. However, we're only interested in the characters inside the placeholder, not the curly brackets surrounding the name. We can exclude those characters by wrapping this portion of the regular expression with parentheses. For the second argument, pass in the route path variable, which contains the original path. Lastly, pass in a variable called param keys. Matches found in our expression will be stored in this variable. Let's dump this variable's value. Next, refresh the page. The expression was able to extract the parameter names without the curly brackets. However, we have the same problem as before. The first item in the array contains a full match. We're only interested in the second result. In addition, the pregmatchAll function formats the results differently than before. The results are stored as a nested array structure. Using the array shift function won't help us in this scenario. Luckily, It'll be easy to grab the key names without curly brackets. Let's head back to the editor. Set the param keys variable to the param keys1 variable. Head back to the browser. This time, we have an array of parameter keys. The last step in this entire process is to merge the parameter keys and parameter values. Head back to the editor. After the param keys variable, define a variable called params set to a function called array combine. We have two arrays. One array contains the parameter values, and the other array contains the parameter keys. We must combine them. That's possible with the array combine function. This function accepts an array of keys and array of values. These arrays are combined to generate a single array. The first argument must be an array of key names. Let's pass in the param keys variable. The second argument is an array of values. Let's pass in the param values variables. This function produces an array of parameters. Let's pass it on to our controller. All controllers will be provided with the array. In the action variable, pass on the parameters variable to the method. It's safe to remove the dump function. Our controller is going to dump the values. If we're able to view an array of parameters, this means our controller has successfully received the route parameters. In the browser, refresh the page. Awesome! We've successfully extracted the values. The parameter values are passed onto our method for handling the response with their respective names. In the next lecture, let's use this information to render the template with the respective data. In this lecture, we're going to work on the template for editing a transaction. For your convenience, I've decided to provide the template for this page. Let's create it before working on the logic. Copy this template to your clipboard. 
Next, switch over to the editor. Inside the source slash views slash transactions folder, create a file called edit.php. Paste the code into this file. Unlike the other templates, I've prepared a lot of code for you. It's nothing you haven't seen before. I'm including partials and rendering error messages. Believe it or not, the form is identical to the form for creating a transaction. The main difference is that it'll edit a transaction instead of creating one. Let's render this template. Open the transaction controller. In the edit view method, we must grab the transaction visited by the user. This logic will be outsourced to our service. Replace the dump function with a method called this transaction service get user transaction. Make sure the method name does not conflict with the other method in our service. The other method uses the plural form of the word transaction. In this example, we're using the singular form. This version of the method will return a single transaction. Let's pass on the param transaction variable. We're going to specify a specific transaction by passing the route parameter to the method. Let's define this method. Open the transaction service. At the bottom of the class, define the getUserTransaction method. The method is going to accept the ID as a string parameter. As a reminder, the route parameter will contain the ID of the transaction. This is how we'll know which transaction to render. Inside our method, we're going to query the database. Return the thisDB query method. Let's pass in the following query. Select asterisk from transactions where id equals colon id and user id equals colon user id. If we were to query the database with the transaction id, we can grab any transaction from our database. That's not what we want. Users should only be able to grab transactions connected to their accounts. Our query should also check the transaction matches the user's ID. For this reason, we're adding the AND clause for checking the user ID. Let's replace these placeholders. In the second argument of the function, pass in an array. Set the ID placeholder to the ID parameter. Next, set the user ID placeholder to the session user variable. Lastly, let's chain the find method to grab the results. There's one more thing I want to add to the query. Users will be able to modify the date of our transaction. Our form should pre-fill the date field with the current value. As a reminder, we're using an input element to render the date field. Browsers have a strict format for dates. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a documentation page on date and time formats. Dates can be tricky because computer languages deal with dates differently. On the sidebar, click on the date strings section. This section takes us to a section on how dates should be formatted for the input elements. According to the documentation, we must output the date by year, month, and day separated with dashes. You'll find some examples on this page. Let's head back to our editor. In the SQL query, we'll modify the format since it's not in the valid format for the browser. Add the following after the asterisk character. Date format date percent %y percent %m percent %d. We're using the date format function to format the value in the date column to the format required by the browser. After this function, Let's assign an alias by using the as keyword. The alias will be called formatted date. We're finished with our query. Let's update the controller to use this information. Head back to the controller. Assign the value returned by the getUserTransaction method to a variable called transaction. It's possible for the query to not return a result. If that's the case, let's redirect the user to the home page. Add a conditional statement to check the transaction variable with the NOT variable. If a transaction can't be found, 
Let's redirect the user to the home page with the redirect to function. Otherwise, let's echo the this view render method. The path to the template is transactions slash edit.php. In the second argument, pass in an array with a key called transaction set to the transaction variable. We're passing on the transaction to the template to pre-fill the form with the values. Let's update our template to display this data. In the template, search for the input field for the description. Set the value attribute to an echo statement for the transaction description variable. Previously, we would pre-fill a form with previous form data. However, this form will be different. We're going to pre-fill the fields with the values from the database. I don't think it makes sense to use previous form data when original data exists. Let's do the same for the amount field. Echo the transaction amount variable any value attribute. Lastly, for the date field, echo the transaction formatted date variable in a value attribute. We're finished. Let's view the form in the browser. If we view any transaction, we'll be able to view the form pre-filled with the data from the database. Let's try testing the redirect behavior. I'm going to update the URL to view a non-existent transaction in my database. As you can see, I'm redirected to the home page. Our route is working as intended. We've successfully rendered the template for editing a transaction. In the next lecture, we're going to process the form submission to update the transaction. In this lecture, we're going to update the transaction after the user has submitted the form. The overall process is going to be familiar to us. We've repeated similar actions. It's a matter of creating a route, outsourcing the logic to a service, and using the service to perform the update. You can probably try this on your own as an exercise. For the rest of you, let's go through the solution together. The first step is to register a route. Open the routes file. At the bottom of the routes, duplicate the transaction route with the route parameter. Next, we'll change the method from get to post. Updating data can be performed with the patch HTTP method. However, our application is simple. We'll stick with post methods for updating or creating data. Next, change the method in our controller to edit. This method doesn't exist in our controller. Let's define it. Open the transaction controller. At the bottom of the class, define the edit method. The route we've created uses the route parameters. This information is going to be necessary for updating the correct transaction. Let's accept the parameters as an array called params. Next, we're going to verify the transaction. We shouldn't update our database unless the user has permission to update the transaction. Luckily, we've already written logic for this. In the EditView method, we're using the getUserTransaction method to grab a transaction. If the transaction doesn't belong to the user, we're redirecting them to the home page. Let's do the same in the Edit method. Copy the transaction variable and conditional statement. Paste this logic into the Edit method. Let's assume the user has permission to edit the transaction. Another step we should take is to validate the form data. Once again, we've already performed this step when creating data. The fields for editing a transaction are the same fields for creating a transaction. Therefore, we can reuse the validation service to validate the form. Call the this validator service validate transaction method with the post variable. Lastly, we can start updating the transaction. This logic will be outsourced in the transaction service. Open this file with your editor. At the bottom of the class, define a method called update. In the parameter list, we're going to accept the form data as an array. In addition, we'll accept the ID of the transaction. Set the type hint to integer. 
We're not going to assume which transaction should be updated. This information must be provided to update the transaction. After receiving this information, let's query the database with the thisDB query method. Type the following query. Update transactions set description equals colon description amount equals colon amount date equals colon date where ID equals colon ID and user ID equals colon user ID. The query is pretty long. All we're doing is updating the transaction with the update keyword. We must configure each value after the set keyword. Multiple columns can be updated by comma separating them. Afterward, we're applying this update to a transaction with the ID passed in and the user's ID. Both conditions will be necessary as we don't want to update a transaction that doesn't belong to a user. In the second argument of the query method, let's pass in an array to replace the placeholders in our query. Set the description placeholder to the form data description variable. The form data variable is the post variable. You can view our template for the names of our fields. To save time, I'll just tell you the names. Next, set the amount placeholder to the form data amount variable. Afterward, set the date placeholder to the form data date variable. Set the ID placeholder to the ID parameter. Lastly, set the user ID placeholder to the session user variable. There is one problem with this query. As a reminder, the date column has the date time data type. Currently, the form only submits the date without the time. We must format the date to be in the proper format. Above our query, define a variable called formatted date with the following value. Form data date 00 colon 00 colon 00. After defining the variable, we can replace the variable in our array with this new value. Our service is ready. Let's invoke this method from our controller. Back in the controller, call the this transaction service update post transaction ID method. Lastly, let's redirect the user to the form. Typically, we would redirect them to a completely different page. However, it's common practice for applications to redirect users to the same form after applying their changes. They may want to make additional changes or verify their values were updated properly. Call the redirect to function. We can grab the URL that caused the form submission with the server variable. Pass in the server HTTP referrer variable. That's it. Let's test our work by submitting the form without making changes to our data. If you did everything right, you should be taken back to the form with the same values. This time, I'm going to modify one of the fields. After doing so, the field I modified was updated. Great! We've successfully updated the transaction. We're 75% finished with our CRUD interface. The last feature to implement is the ability to delete a transaction. In the next set of lectures, let's focus on deleting a transaction from our database. In this lecture, we're going to start working on deleting a transaction. We're going to run into a small problem with this process. To understand the problem, let's take a look at the index template. In this template, I want you to search for a comment that says Actions. In this table data cell, there's a form. Under the hood, the delete button is a form. If the user clicks this button, it'll initiate the process of deleting a category. The form is going to need a few adjustments. Firstly, the action attribute should be set to the following path slash transaction slash echo transaction ID. We're using the same URL for editing a transaction. After all, it's the same resource. The main difference will be the method. That's where our troubles begin. The method attribute can be modified to change the HTTP method of our form submission. Unfortunately, browsers limit this attribute's value to get and post. 
we can't set this attribute to delete. To get around this issue, Frameworks allow developers to override the HTTP method by adding a hidden input field. It's a feature we'll add to our framework. Let me show you how that works. The first step is to make sure the method attribute is set to post. If it is, we'll use this opportunity to modify the method. Next, inside the form, add a hidden input element. Set the name attribute to underscore method. Lastly, set the value attribute to delete. We're going to send a hidden field called method. If we're sending a post request, our framework will check if there's an input with this name. Upon detecting this input, we'll change the method of the request to the method set in the value attribute. This is how we'll trick our browser into submitting a delete request. One more thing. Let's load the CSRF fields by calling the thisResolve method with the partials slash underscore csrf.php file. The form is ready. Our next step is to register a route. Open the routes files. At the bottom of the function, let's make a copy of the get method for editing a transaction. The route for deleting a category is going to be similar to the other routes. The main difference is that the HTTP method is delete. A delete method can be registered by changing the method from get to delete. Next, the method name to handle this request will be called delete. Currently, the application method does not support delete methods. Let's define a method for registering routes with the delete method. Open the application class from our framework. In this class, search for the post method. The method for registering a delete HTTP method will be similar to this method. Let's create a copy of this method. Next, we can rename the method to delete. Lastly, in the first argument of the router add method, we can change the HTTP method from post to delete. After making those changes, our application will be able to register a route for delete HTTP requests. Before updating our router to support this method, let's define the method for handling the response in the transaction controller. At the bottom of the class, define a method called delete. Next, accept the route parameters as an array. The parameters are going to be necessary for determining the transaction to delete. Inside the method, we'll confirm the route was visited by dumping the params parameters. The last step in this process is to update our router. Open the router file. Technically, the request is being sent as a POST request. We're going to check if the underscore method input was sent with the request. If it was, we'll override the HTTP method to the value of this field. However, we don't want to modify the method immediately. We should verify the underscore method field exists in the form submission. Scroll to the dispatch method. In this method, we're defining a variable called method. Inside the string to upper function, add the following, post underscore method, nullish coalescing operator. In this example, we're checking if the field exists. If it does, it'll be used as the value for the method. Otherwise, we'll use the original HTTP method from the server variable, which is what we passed into the method when dispatching the route. After making those changes, we can test our work by refreshing the home page. You should be able to click on any of the delete buttons for the transactions. After doing so, our application modified the request to be delete instead of post. This is proven by the fact that we're able to view the contents of the route parameters. Awesome! With this information, we'll be able to properly delete the category. In the next lecture, we're going to begin querying the database to delete this record. In this lecture, we're going to update our controller to delete a transaction after the form was submitted. If you haven't already, 
open the transaction controller. In this controller, we dumped the contents of the route parameters inside the delete method. Let's update this method to delete the category. This logic will be outsourced to our service. Open the transaction service. At the bottom of this method, we'll define a method called delete for handling this logic. The service shouldn't assume which transaction to delete. We'll accept this information as an argument. Add a parameter called id with the integer data type. After receiving this information, we can query the database to delete the transaction. Call the thisDB query method. Write the following query. Delete from transactions where id equals colon id and user id equals colon user id. We're using the delete from keywords to perform a deletion in the transaction table. It's important to include the user ID column in the WHERE condition to prevent users from deleting transactions that don't belong to them. Let's pass in an array with the placeholder data. Set the ID placeholder to the ID parameter. Next, set the user ID placeholder to the session user variable. Our service is ready. Let's call this method from our controller. Back in the controller, remove the dump function with the this transaction service delete method. Pass in the params transaction variable. This invocation can cause an issue. Our method expects an integer. Query parameter values are always strings. Let's typecast the value into an integer before passing it onto our service. The last step is to redirect the user after submitting the form. Let's redirect them to the home page with the redirect to function. That's it. We should be able to delete the transaction. In your browser, navigate to the home page. If we click on the delete button, the application should take a few moments to delete the transaction. After a few moments, we'll be redirected to the home page. As you can see, the transaction was successfully deleted. Pat yourself on the back. We've successfully created a CRUD interface. Overall, it's very basic. We're able to create, read, update, and delete transactions. You're likely to repeat this process from most tables in your database. Our transaction interface was pretty simple. In the next section, we're going to finalize our application before deployment by adding support for uploading files. Users may have receipts they may want to associate with transactions for record keeping purposes. Let's add the ability to upload files to our application. That's going to be the main focus of the next section. When you're ready, I'll see you there. In this lecture, we're going to start working on the next feature of our application. It's going to be the final feature before we start polishing our code for deployment. Uploading receipts is a common feature found among expense tracking applications. A receipt can be uploaded to a specific transaction. This section is going to handle file uploads. Uploading files can be tricky because there's a lot of validation and security you must perform to store files. We're going to take our time handling file uploads. To get started, we must have an interface for uploading files. In the resource section of this lecture, I prepared a controller and templates. For the templates, I recommend creating a directory dedicated to receipts. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to create these files in our project. I'm going to do so quickly. I'll be right back. I have finished creating the files from the gist. Let's quickly review them. In the controller, you're going to find two methods. One method is called upload view. This method is responsible for rendering the template for uploading a receipt. Before doing so, we're verifying the related transactions. Receipts are going to be associated with a transaction. If a transaction doesn't exist, we shouldn't allow the user to upload a receipt file. Moving along, the second method is called Upload. It'll handle processing the file upload. It doesn't contain much code as we'll be writing most of the logic for this process. Let's check out the template. The template contains a basic form. There's only one field which is a field for uploading a file. The most important attribute is the type. 
it must be set to file. Otherwise, users won't be able to upload files. Other than that, there's nothing else worth mentioning about the template. Let's register a route for this page. Open the routes file. At the top of the file, import the receipt controller class from the app backslash controllers namespace. You may be wondering, why aren't we adding this logic to the transaction controller? Technically, we could. However, the transaction controller is starting to become cluttered. To save room, I've decided to use a separate controller for readability. Let's define the route. Scroll to our list of routes. Let's copy the get and post routes for editing a transaction. Next, add the slash receipt segment to both routes. Set the controller to the receipt controller in both routes. Lastly, set the methods to upload view and upload, respectively. That should take care of registering the template. The last step is to create a link to view this page. Open the index template for the transactions feature. Scroll to our table's body. In the last column, we have a set of links and a form for deleting a transaction. The first anchor element is responsible for providing a link to the upload receipt page. Let's update the href attribute to the following. Slash transaction slash echo e transaction id slash receipt. Perfect! We're finished. Let's view the home page in the browser. On this page, we can click on any of the transaction upload buttons. After doing so, we're taken to the upload page. You should see something similar to what I see. It's a simple input to upload a file. Awesome! In the next lecture, we're going to start working on this form to upload a file. In this lecture, we're going to update our form to support file uploads. Submitting forms with files is different from submitting forms with input fields. By default, Forms send data as plain text, which is the simplest and cost-effective way of sending data. This solution worked for most of our forms. However, we have a form to submit file data. File data can't be read as plain text. Files, like images or videos, can contain complex data that can't easily be read or written as plain text. If we were to submit our form as is, the file data would not be submitted. Our browser doesn't know how to transmit file data from the client to the server. We must explicitly tell our browser to encode our file data. By doing so, it'll send data across the network without our files being corrupted. In your editor, open the create.php file for the receipts feature. On the form element, we can encode file data by adding an attribute called encoding type. This attribute tells the browser to encode file data. The value for this attribute must be set to multipart slash form data. By adding this attribute, we can safely submit file data. There's one thing you should know when using this attribute. The method must always be set to post. You cannot use the get method. Luckily, I've already configured the method for this form. Let's update our controller. Scroll to the upload method. As a reminder, this method gets executed when the form is submitted. Before proceeding, let's verify the form data is being received. Inside the method, call the custom dump function with a variable called files. The files variable is a super global variable defined by PHP. It contains an array of files uploaded to the server. We don't have to do anything to make sure it's available. Next, Head over to the browser. Try uploading a file and submitting the form. As you can see, our file was received by our server. It's an array of files submitted to the server. We have access to file information, such as the file name and size. Now that we have access to this information, we can start storing it on our server. Let's continue handling the file upload in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to create a service for validating and uploading receipts. Check out the resource section of this lecture. 
I provide a link to a list of functions for interacting with files. PHP has dozens of functions for working with files, from moving them to checking the file size. We'll be using these methods to help us validate and upload files. First, we must decide where to write this logic. One option is to use the transaction service, but I don't want to clutter the service with more code. Handling file uploads is going to require dozens of lines of code. For a better organization, let's outsource the logic to a completely different service. Try tackling this as an exercise. I want you to create a receipt service. Register this service with the container and inject it into the receipt controller. During this process, define a method for validating files. This method should accept a file and dump the contents to verify the service is receiving the file. From your controller, call this method. Pause the video and give the exercise a try. Good luck! Welcome back. If you are able to create the service, that's great. If not, let's try creating it together. Inside the app slash services directory, create a file called receiptservice.php. Let's set the namespace to app backslash services. Next, import the framework backslash database class. The receipt service is going to require access to the database. We'll be outsourcing the logic for storing the file data in the database with this service. Let's define the receipt service class. To inject the database, define the construct method. Inside the parameter list, define a property called db with the database class as the type. As mentioned before, let's define a method for validating file uploads. Below the construct method, define a method called validateFile. The file is accessible via the controller. Technically, we have access to the files variable from the service too. However, I think it would be a good idea to accept the file. By doing so, we can pass in any file to this method to perform validation. It'll make the method more flexible. Add an array parameter called file. Next, add the question mark character before the data type. This character allows for a parameter to have a null value. At the moment, it's completely possible for a user to submit the form without uploading a file. If that's the case, the file is going to be null. During validation, we'll properly check if the file is null. For now, let's dump the contents of the file parameter to verify our service receives the file. Our service is ready. Time to add it to the definitions. Open the container definitions file. At the top of the file, import the receipt service class from the app backslash services namespace. Next, add the receipt service class to the array. Set the value to an anonymous function. We're using an anonymous function to set the database. Our service expects the database as a dependency. In the parameter list, accept the container instance. Inside our function, we'll instantiate the database by grabbing it from the container. Define a variable called db. The value will be the following, container get database class. After grabbing the instance, we can start instantiating the service. Return an instance of the receipt service with the db instance. The last step is to inject our service into the controller. Open the receipt controller. We'll inject the instance into this controller. At the top of the file, import the app backslash services backslash receipt service class. Next, inside the construct method, define a private property called receipt service. The data type should be the receipt service class. Lastly, we'll call the validate file method from the upload method. Remove the custom dump function. It's not necessary to dump the file data. 
After the conditional statement, we can proceed to validate the file. It's important to perform validation before proceeding to other steps. First, let's grab the file. Define a variable called receipt file. Set it to the following. Files, receipt, nullish, coalescing, operator, null. If the form was submitted without uploading a file, the receipt item is going to be empty. If that's the case, we'll set the default value of the receipt file variable to null. We'll pass it on to our service. Call the thisReceiptServiceValidateFile method with the files variable. Let's head over to the browser. I'm going to view the page for uploading receipts. If we did everything right, the page should load normally. As you can see, the page loads without throwing an error. PHP was able to inject the service class into our controller. After verifying the page works, we can start uploading files. Try uploading a file. Once again, we're able to view the file contents. This time, our service is able to receive the data. In the next lecture, we'll start fleshing out the service to validate the file upload. In this lecture, we're going to validate the file upload. By default, files uploaded to our server are stored in a temporary location. PHP does not handle storing files on our server. We must handle this process ourselves. Otherwise, the file would be lost forever. Before we store the file, we should validate the file. So far, we've been using a custom validator to perform validation. We could update it to validate files. However, validating files can be tricky as file uploads can have various requirements. For that reason, we're going to be performing validation directly inside our service. So, where do we begin? First, we should verify a file has been uploaded. At the moment, it's completely possible for a user to submit the form without uploading a file. Let's check for a file before proceeding. Open the service. After grabbing the file, we can start validating the files. Add a conditional statement with the following condition, not file. If this variable is empty, a file was not uploaded. If that's the case, let's throw an exception. I want to display an error message below the file upload file. In that case, let's throw the validation exception class. First, let's import it. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash exceptions backslash validation exception class. Back in the conditional statement, let's throw the validation exception class. Since we're not using our custom validator, we must generate an error message. Let's pass in an array. In this array, set the receipt field to the following message. Failed to upload file. This error message is going to appear below the receipt field. However, we're not done yet. It's possible for file uploads to fail. For example, if the user is on an unstable internet connection, the file may be partially uploaded. We should make sure the file was successfully transferred from the user's machine to ours. Let's chain another condition. Set the condition to the following. File error does not strictly equal upload error OK. Every file has a few keys. One of them is called error, which contains the code for an error. PHP generates error messages for various upload errors. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to these messages. As you can see, PHP defines various constants for file uploads. One of these constants is called upload error OK. If the error equals this message, we can assume the file was uploaded successfully. Otherwise, we can throw an exception. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, try submitting the form without uploading a file. Our controller was able to reject the request and throw an error. Next, let's try uploading a file. This time, the upload goes through. We're able to view the uploaded file. Perfect! We've successfully checked if a file was uploaded. There are more things we should check for. In the next lecture, let's try validating the file size. In this lecture, we're going to validate the file size. 
We don't want users to upload large files. Server resources can quickly become consumed. Bandwidth and storage can become expensive when dealing with large file sizes. It's always good practice to verify the file size before storing it on our machines. We're going to continue working inside the validate file method of our service. Let's add this part of the verification process after the second conditional statement. First, let's define a variable called max file size MB with an initial value of 3. We're going to limit file uploads to 3 megabytes. This file size should suffice for most cases. Feel free to increase or decrease the size as you see fit. Next, let's add a conditional statement with the following condition. File size greater than max file size MB. The file size can be retrieved via the size key. This method returns the size in bytes. That's a problem because our variable stores the maximum size in megabytes. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to file sizes. File sizes are measured in bytes. There are different units for bytes, such as kilobytes and megabytes. If we want to compare the two sizes, we must convert our variable from megabytes to bytes. According to this page, a megabyte is made up of 1024 kilobytes. Next, a kilobyte is made up of 1024 bytes. Therefore, if we want to convert a megabyte into a byte, we must multiply our size by 1024. Afterward, we can convert the kilobyte size into bytes by multiplying the value again by 1024. Let's give that a try. Head back to your editor. Multiply the value twice by 1024. That should work. Our condition checks if the file size exceeds our limits. If it does, let's throw a validation exception. Pass in an array with the receipt key. The message for this error will be the following. File upload is too large. Let's try testing our application. Head over to the browser. I'm going to upload a file larger than 3 megabytes. After doing so, the application informs us that the file is too large. Awesome! That's exactly what we wanted. In the next lecture, let's continue validating our file. In this lecture, we're going to validate the file name. File names can contain special characters, which can be a hassle to deal with from time to time. Rather than deal with special characters, let's limit what can be used as a file name. Validating file names can be performed with regular expressions. Let's give it a try. We're going to continue working inside the service. First, we must grab the current file name. At the bottom of the upload method, define a variable called original file name. Its value will be a variable called file name. Next, add a conditional statement. The condition will be the preg match function with the not operator. The preg match function can be used to perform a regular expression on a string. It has two arguments. The first argument is the pattern. Inside this argument, pass in the following. Slash, left square bracket, right square bracket, slash. A pair of slashes are required for regular expressions. Inside these slashes, we can write the regular expression. In this example, we're adding a pair of square brackets to specify a range of acceptable characters. Let's set the range to uppercase A dash Z, lowercase A dash Z, 0 dash 9. All alphabetic and numeric characters are acceptable. It's important to note that we're allowing for both uppercase and lowercase letters. Most programming languages consider uppercase and lowercase versions of a letter to be different characters. Let's add a dot, underscore, and dash character to the range. Typically, file names can have these characters. Lastly, add a backslash s character. This character represents a space. Make sure you're adding it after the 0-9 portion of the expression. Otherwise, you may receive an error. We're not finished yet. 
Let's add a carrot at the beginning of the pattern. This instructs the pattern to match these ranges of characters against the beginning of the string. At the end of the expression, add a plus sign. This character indicates to match multiple characters instead of a single character. Lastly, add the dollar sign character. This character instructs the pattern to match against characters at the end of the string. We're finished with the expression. Let's pass in the original file name variable to perform the pattern against this string. If the pattern fails, we don't have a valid file name. In that case, let's throw a validation exception. The message for the receipt field will be the following, invalid file name. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. I'm going to upload a file with a dollar sign character in the name. After doing so, the validation failed. Validating the file name is optional. I like to validate it because I've encountered problems with strange file names. It's better to restrict file names to reduce the possibility of a strange error from occurring. In the next lecture, let's perform another validation. In this lecture, we're going to validate the mind type of a file. It's common practice to limit the type of files that can be uploaded to a server. We should verify the file type before proceeding. Typically, file extensions are useful for indicating the contents of a file. While useful, file extensions are easy to spoof. Mind types are more difficult to spoof. While not impossible to spoof, Checking the MIME type is safer than checking for the file extension. So, what is a MIME type? Most files store the type of file inside the file itself. This is referred to as the MIME type. That's different from a file extension where the extension is stored in the file name. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to an official list of MIME types. The format for a MIME type is the category followed by the type. The category and type are separated with a slash. If you were to look through the list, some MIME types share a category. For example, PNG and JPEG files share the image category. This can be useful for accepting a wide range of MIME types. For our application, we're going to limit uploads to PDF and image files. Let's write the code for checking the MIME type. Open the validate file method in our service. Below our other validation checks, let's grab the MIME type from the file. Define a variable called client MIME type. Its value will be the file type variable. Grabbing the MIME type is as simple as accessing it from the array. Next, let's define an array of acceptable MIME types. Define an array called allowed MIME types. Add the following MIME types image slash jpeg, image slash png, application slash pdf. These are the MIME types for jpeg, png, and pdf files. Next, add a conditional statement. The condition will be the inArray function with the not operator. This function checks if a value exists within an array. It has two arguments. The first argument is the value to search for from within the array. Let's pass in the file MIME type variable. Next, we must provide the array. Let's pass in the allowed MIME types array. If this condition fails, the user has uploaded an incorrect file type. Let's throw a validation exception. Set the receipt field to the following error message invalid file type. Great! That's the last validation we're going to perform. These validations are not perfect, but they should be suitable for most cases. If a file can pass these validation checks, we can safely start storing the file. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, try uploading a file that's not an image or PDF. As expected, we get an error. Next, let's try uploading an image. 
This time, the file gets dumped. We're finished with our validation. Before moving on, let's go back to the service to remove the dump function. It's not necessary to dump the contents of the file. In the next lecture, let's begin storing the file after validating it. In this lecture, we're going to generate a random file name. Storing files with their original file name can lead to issues. If a file is uploaded with the same name as another file, it would override the existing file. This issue could lead to unexpected behavior in our application. To prevent this issue from occurring, it's common practice to rename the file. The file name should be unique. Let's generate a random file name. We're going to continue working inside the upload method of our controller. Uploading a file is going to be outsourced to the receipt service. After the validate method, run a method called this receipt service upload method. This method will be responsible for handling the file upload. It's going to need the file upload. Pass in the receipt file variable. Our editor is going to throw an error because this method doesn't exist in our service. Let's take care of that. Open the receipt service class. At the bottom of the class, define the upload method. In the parameter list, add the array file parameter to accept the file data. Now we can start generating a file name. Define a variable called new file name. Set the value to a function called random bytes. As the name suggests, this function generates a random value in bytes. It's a function we're already familiar with from a previous lecture. The size of the value can be configured through the first argument. Let's set the size to 16. Bytes are not readable. They're machine code. The value generated by this function won't be suitable for a file name. Luckily, there's a function for transforming bytes into a string. Wrap this function with another function called binary to hex. This function returns a readable string suitable for file names. We've got a random file name, but it's going to be missing the file extension. Let's quickly grab the file extension. Above the variable, define another variable called file extension. Set the value to a function called pathinfo. The pathinfo function can extract information from a path. This includes the extension. There are two arguments. The first argument is the path to the file. Let's pass in the file name variable. Next, we can configure the type of value to return from the function. If we hover our mouse over this function, our editor documents the type of values we can grab, one of them being the extension. Let's pass in the path info extension constant. After grabbing the extension, let's update the new file name variable by appending the file extension variable. Lastly, let's verify the file name by dumping the value. Next, head over to the browser. I'm going to upload a valid file. As you can see, a random file name was generated with the correct extension. Everything is ready. In the next lecture, we're going to start storing the file with the new file name. In this lecture, we're going to write the file to our system. As always, we're going to be working inside the upload method from our service. After generating a file name, we can store the file with the new name. But where should we upload our file? If you have a project that allows file uploads, I recommend dedicating a directory for this task. In the root directory of our project, create a directory called storage slash uploads. You may be wondering, why are we using a dedicated directory? One location for storing file uploads is the public directory. After all, we're going to allow users to download their files after uploading them. They'll need to be publicly accessible. That works, but there's one problem with that approach. Receipts contain sensitive information. If we were to add them to the public directory, all receipts would be publicly available. We should restrict access to uploaded files. Users should only be allowed to download their receipt files. So, why not the source directory? 
our source directory is dedicated to containing our application and framework logic. Receipt files don't contribute anything to our application. For these reasons, we're going to have a completely separate directory for storing file uploads. Let's modify our project to support this directory. Open the paths file. Let's define a constant for pointing to our upload directory. Define a constant called storage uploads. Set it to the following value. Directory dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash storage slash uploads. After adding this constant, let's update our service to use it. In the service file, import the app backslash config backslash paths class. Scroll back to the upload method. PHP is going to require a full system path for uploading a file. At the moment, we only have the new file name. Let's store the complete path in a variable. Define a variable called upload path. Its value will be the following path storage uploads dot slash dot new file name. We're concatenating the storage uploads constant with the new file name variable to generate a full system path. After generating this path, we can proceed to upload a file. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be the move uploaded file function with the not operator. This function is defined by PHP. As the name implies, it'll move a file uploaded to our server to a different directory. Keep in mind, PHP stores files in a temporary directory. This directory is cleared every once in a while. Therefore, the file is never stored permanently. It's up to us to move the file, which can be performed with this function. It has two arguments. The first argument is the current location of the file. PHP provides this location in the file array. Pass in the file temporary name variable. Next, we must provide a new location for the file. Let's pass in the upload path variable. The move uploaded file function returns a boolean value. If the move fails, PHP returns false. In that case, let's inform the user we failed to upload the file. Throw a new instance of the validation exception class. Set the receipt field to the following message, failed to upload file. We're keeping our message vague. We shouldn't tell the user the server is failing. It could leave us vulnerable to attacks if the user knows what's going on. We're finished with the logic for uploading the file. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, try uploading a valid file. After a few moments, we're taken back to the home page. We can verify the file was uploaded by viewing the storage slash uploads directory. Switch over to your editor to view this directory. As you can see, our file was uploaded successfully. It took a while, but we finally uploaded a file. Most of the process involves validating the file before safely storing it on our system. In the next lecture, we're going to store the file's information in our database. In this lecture, we're going to start working on a table for receipts. At the moment, we're uploading a receipt. After a file has been uploaded, we don't know who owns the receipt. We don't even know which transaction to apply the receipt to in our database. To store file information, we should design a table for storing receipts. I'm using the Draw SQL tool again. Let's design a table before writing code. Add a new table called Receipts. The first column is going to be the ID. We're given the ID by the tool. Let's move on to the next column. Add three columns called Original File Name, Storage File Name, and Media Type. Their types are going to be varchar. We have two columns for storing the file name. As the names imply, we're going to store the original and new file names. But why? Wouldn't the new file name suffice? Well, what if a user wants to download their receipt? We should keep the original file name intact as an extra precaution. Users may be surprised to find their file was renamed. 
It's completely possible to rename a file while it's being downloaded. That's something we'll learn how to do in an upcoming lecture. For now, to prepare for that scenario, we must store the original file name. As for the media type column, this column is going to store the MIME type. Grabbing the MIME type can be a costly operation. To save time, we're going to store the MIME type to save on resources. This information will be necessary for downloading a file. Let's add another column called Transaction ID with the big integer type. A receipt is going to have a relationship with a transaction. Let's select the Transactions table. Connect the ID column to the Transaction ID column. A single transaction can have many receipts, whereas a receipt can belong to one transaction. From the perspective of the Transactions table, the relationship is one to many. Our table's design is complete. Hopefully, this gives you an idea of what our table is going to look like. The next step is to create an entity. In the Resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist. This gist contains the code for creating the receipt table. To save time, I've decided to prepare the query. We're creating a table called Receipts. The columns are the same columns outlined in the drawing. In addition, we're adding the primary and foreign key. There is one piece of this query that's new to you. For the foreign key, we're adding something called an action. What do you think would happen if a user deletes a transaction? The transaction would be deleted from the database. But what about the receipts? What if the deleted transaction has receipts associated with it from the receipts table? In that case, we should delete the receipts too. This process can be performed with PHP or SQL. In this example, we're using SQL. If we have a foreign key, our database can keep track of the row from the transactions table. Deleting a record from the transaction can cause the receipts table to react. If there are rows associated with the deleted transaction, we can trigger an action. Actions can be applied by adding the on keyword followed by the action name. In this example, we're listening for the delete action. After this action, we're adding the cascade keyword. This keyword instructs our database to delete records from the receipts table associated with the transaction. The process becomes completely automated. We don't have to query the receipts table to perform this action. Once again, you don't have to use SQL. This process is completely possible with PHP. However, I think this solution is more elegant. We don't have to worry about deleting foreign keys. They can handle themselves. Copy this code to your clipboard. Next, open the database.sql file in your editor. Paste the query at the bottom of the file. Fantastic! We're ready to perform a migration. Switch over to the command line. Run the composer run script phpiggy command. Let's verify our migration was successful by opening phpMyAdmin. If we refresh the database, the receipts table has been created. It has all the columns from our original design. It's time to start inserting the receipt uploaded by the user into the database. In the next lecture, we'll begin inserting this information. In this lecture, we're going to store the receipt in our database after the file has been uploaded. Inserting data into our database will be like the query for inserting a transaction. All we have to do is use the query method. Let's give it a shot. Open the controller class. Adding a receipt to the database will be performed with the upload method from our service. Before inserting a receipt, the database is going to need the transaction ID. Currently, our service doesn't know which transaction the receipt belongs to. Let's update the upload method to accept the transaction ID. Pass in the transaction ID variable. Next. Open the Receipt Service class. Next, scroll to the bottom of the upload method. In the parameter list, add an integer parameter called Transaction. With this information at our disposal, we can perform the query. At the bottom of the upload method, call the ThisDB query method. Next, write the following query. 
Insert into receipts, transaction ID, original file name, storage file name, media type values, transaction ID, original file name, storage file name, media type. All columns are going to have a value except for the ID column. Our table auto-generates a value for it. Let's begin updating the placeholders with their respective values by passing in an array as the second argument to the query method. First, set the transaction ID placeholder to the transaction variable. Next, set the original file name placeholder to the file name variable. Afterward, set the storage file name placeholder to the new file name variable. Lastly, set the media type placeholder to the file type variable. Our query is ready. It's time to test our work. Head over to the browser. I'm going to upload a file. After the file was submitted, we're taken back to the home page. At the moment, we can't verify the receipt was added to the transaction on our application. We haven't added the logic for displaying receipts. To verify the receipt was inserted, switch over to phpMyAdmin to view the receipts table. As you can see, our receipt was added. We've successfully stored the receipt with the transaction. Since the transaction is associated with a user, it'll also be associated with a specific user. In the next lecture, we're going to wrap up this section by displaying the receipt to the user. In this lecture, we're going to display a list of receipts to the user. Our first step is to update our service for retrieving transactions. Receipts are always associated with transactions. It's likely users will want to know what receipts are connected to a transaction. In our table, we have a column for displaying all receipts. Therefore, for every transaction on our page, we must query the database for receipts connected to each transaction. Unlike the other requests, the home page is going to be performing dozens of queries. There's no such thing as too many queries. What matters more is the type of query being performed. Some queries perform slower than others. In our case, retrieving an array of receipts won't hurt the performance of our application. We won't be doing anything that will be complicated. With that being said, let's start grabbing the receipts. In your editor, open the transaction service. Scroll to the get user transactions method. This method is responsible for querying the database for a list of transactions for the home page. After the transactions variable, we're going to loop through the results. Set the transactions variable to the array map function. On each iteration, we'll update the results to contain the receipts. This is why we're using the array map function. Let's pass in an anonymous function as the first argument. Next, pass in the transactions variable as the second argument. By passing in the transactions variable, the array map function loops through the items in the array. On each iteration, our anonymous function gets called. From this function, we must return a new value to replace the existing item. For this example, we're not interested in completely replacing the item. We want to add additional information to the existing results. Let's accept the current item in the loop in the parameter list. We'll refer to each item as transaction with the array type. Next, let's return the parameter. Great, let's start adding the receipts. Before returning the value, add a new item to the transaction array called receipts. The value will be the thisDB query method. Write the following query. Select asterisk from receipts where transaction underscore ID equals colon transaction ID. In this query, we're selecting all receipts where the transaction ID equals the ID passed into the query. Since we're looping through each item in the transactions array, we have access to the current ID. In the second argument, pass in an array. Set the transaction ID placeholder to the transaction ID variable. Next, 
chain the find all method to grab all results from our query. That's it. We're repeatedly performing this query on each iteration. That's perfectly fine. It's necessary to grab the receipts. The next step is to loop through the results from the template. Open the index template for the transactions feature. In this template, search for an HTML comment that says receipt list. Under this comment, there's a div element with a link and form. We're going to loop through this element to display each receipt associated with a transaction. Wrap this element with the for each tag. The expression will be transaction receipts as receipt. By adding the receipt to each transaction, we have access to the array of receipts associated with the current transaction. Let's update the links. The first anchor element should take the user to a route for downloading a specific receipt. Set the href attribute to the following value, slash transaction, slash echo e transaction id, slash receipt, slash echo e receipt id. This route doesn't exist in our application. That's perfectly fine. We'll be adding it in a future lecture. Unlike other routes, this route has two dynamic values. Luckily, our router supports multiple route parameters. It isn't a problem that we're using more than one dynamic value. In addition, both pieces of information will be necessary for grabbing the correct receipt. You'll see why in a future lecture. Below this element, we have a form element for deleting the transaction. It's a button that'll take the user to a route to initiate the deletion process. Typically, we would submit forms to the same page. However, since the receipts are being displayed on the home page, we should redirect the user to a route dedicated to deletion. On this element, set the action attribute to the same URL as the anchor element. You can copy and paste this value into the action attributes. Within this form, I've added the underscore method input to alter the HTTP method to delete. This step is important. Otherwise, our application may assume we're not trying to delete a resource. One more thing. Let's include the partials slash underscore csrf.php file with the thisResolve method. Let's quickly define routes described in our template. Open the routes file. The routes are going to be defined at the bottom of our function. Let's add a new get route. The pattern will be a copy of the route to a receipt. The main difference is that we're going to point to a specific receipt. Add a new parameter called receipt. Unlike other routes, this route is going to have two IDs. The ID for the transaction and ID for the receipt. Next. Let's set the method to the download from the receipt controller class. Afterward, create a copy of this route. The HTTP method is going to be delete. Set the method name to delete. I almost forgot. Before defining these methods for the routes, let's apply middleware to prevent access to them. Chain the add method to each route. As you do so, Set the middleware to the auth required middleware class. I'm going to quickly apply this middleware to all transaction and receipt routes. After defining the routes, let's quickly define the methods. Both methods are going to be defined inside the receipt controller. Open this controller. At the bottom of the class, define the download and delete methods. During this process, be sure to accept the route parameters with the array type. The route parameters will be necessary for grabbing the correct receipt. Great! The initial setup of the templates and routes is ready. In the next set of lectures, we're going to flesh out these methods to perform their respective actions. In this lecture, we're going to start working on the request for downloading a receipt. Like most pages, we should validate the request. Users should only be able to download receipts that exist and belong to them. This lecture is going to focus on verifying this information. Let's get started. In your editor, open the receipt controller. 
we're going to work on the download method. The first step is to verify the transaction exists. Define a variable called transaction. It'll be set to the following method. This transaction service get user transaction params transaction. We already have a method from our transaction service to grab a transaction. It'll return the results or a boolean value. We can check the value to verify the transaction exists. Afterward, add a conditional statement to check if the transaction variable is empty. If it is, redirect the user to the home page with the redirect to function. Next, let's verify the receipt exists in our database. Define a variable called receipt. Its value will be the following method. This receipt service get receipt params receipt. Afterward, the conditional statement is going to be the same as the previous condition. The main difference will be checking the receipt variable. Lastly, we'll redirect the user to the home page with the redirect to function. You may have noticed the get receipt method does not exist. The purpose of this method will be to grab a single receipt. It'll have one argument, which is the ID of the receipt to grab. Let's define it. Open the receipt service. At the bottom of the class, define the get receipt method. In the parameter list, add the ID parameter with the string type. Inside this method, we'll query the database for the query. Define a variable called receipt. The value will be the thisDBQueryFind method. Inside the query method, write the following query. Select asterisk from receipts, where id equals colon id. Next, pass in an array. Set the id placeholder to the id parameter. Lastly, return the receipt variable. The query we've written selects a single receipt from the receipts table by its id. After making that change, our service should not be throwing errors anymore. There's one more verification I'd like to perform. What if the IDs are valid, but they're not associated with each other? Technically, users can try accessing a receipt from a different transaction. Our verification allows for these types of requests. To prevent users from accessing a receipt from a different transaction, we should compare the ID of the transaction to the ID in the receipt. Add a new conditional statement. The condition will be the following. Receipt transaction ID does not strictly equal transaction ID. If the transaction ID associated with the receipt does not equal the transaction ID in the receipt, let's redirect the user to the home page with the redirect to function. That'll do it for validation. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, view the list of transactions. Next, click on the receipt icon to view a specific receipt. Upon clicking the receipt, we'll be given a blank page. That's to be expected since we haven't written the code for downloading a file. As long as you're not getting an error, you're good to go. In the next lecture, we're going to start downloading the file. In this lecture, we're going to force the user to download the receipt after clicking on a link. To perform this process, we must have access to the file. That's where things get tricky. Uploaded files are not publicly accessible. They're inside the storage directory. Currently, our server only exposes the public directory. Luckily, PHP makes it easy to render files other than HTML. We're going to continue working inside the download method of our controller. After the conditional statements, let's grab the file. We'll outsource the logic for reading a file into our service. Run a method called this receipt service read. This method will need the receipt data. Pass along the receipt variable. Next, open the receipt service. At the bottom of the class, define the read method. In the parameter list, accept the receipt variable with the array data type. 
The first step is to check if the file exists. We shouldn't read a file unless the file can be found in our storage. Let's grab the full system path to the file. To find a variable called file path with the following value. Paths storage upload dot slash dot receipt storage file name. We're concatenating the path from our constant with the storage file name. Our receipt stores two file names, which are the original file name and the storage file name. As a reminder, we created a randomized file name to prevent files from being overwritten. For this reason, we must grab the file by its random file name, which was stored in the storage file name column. Now that we have the file, let's verify it exists. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be the file exists function with the not operator. The file exists function is defined by PHP. As the name implies, this function checks if a file exists on our system. It has one argument, which is the path to the file. Pass in the file path variable. If the function is unable to find the file, false is returned, causing our condition to run. In that case, Let's redirect the user to the home page with the redirect to function. Otherwise, we can proceed to download the file. First, we must modify the headers with the header function. By default, servers send responses as plain text or HTML. Makes sense, right? Browsers are used for rendering pages. We never had to worry about telling the browser we were sending HTML because our server took care of that step for us. This time, things are different. We want to send a completely different file type. If we're sending data other than HTML, it's up to us to tell the browser our server is sending a different type of data. We can do so by adding headers to the response. Otherwise, browsers may misinterpret our file as an HTML document. We can configure the file information by setting a header called content-disposition. The header can be configured by passing it in as a string. As a reminder, headers are case sensitive. Make sure your header name matches mine. The content-disposition header is available to tell the browser how to download the file. Browsers are not limited to viewing HTML files. Image and video files can be previewed within the browser we have the option of overriding this behavior. There are two possible values for this header. We can set this header to inline to tell the browser to attempt to render the file from within the browser. It's not guaranteed to happen, but the browser will try its best. The other value is attachment. This option tells the browser to download the file. Since receipts can be uploaded as images or PDF files, I think it makes sense to use inline. Next, we can add a semicolon followed by an option called file name. If the user decides to download the file, we can suggest the file name. Let's set this option to the receipt original file name variable. This time, we're using the original file name for downloads. Using the storage name would feel weird. Let's add another header by calling the header function again. This time, we're going to set the content-type header. Our browser doesn't know what type of file we're sending over. Sometimes, it's capable of determining the file type. However, it's considered safer to tell the browser of the file type to prevent it from incorrectly guessing the type. Let's set the header to the receipt media type variable. After configuring the headers, we can start sending the file. Run a function called readFile. File data must be sent with the body, not the header. We configured the headers to set the file name and MIME type. The actual data itself must be sent via the body of the response. We can do so with the readFile function. The readFile function requires the path to the file to read. We stored that information in the file path variable. After making those changes, we should be able to download a file. Let's refresh the page in the browser. I'm going to click on a receipt. As I do so, 
the receipt gets displayed on my browser. This is because the content disposition header is set to inline. Our browser attempts to display the file from within the browser if it can. Most browsers support images and PDF files. It shouldn't have a problem displaying receipts. Congrats! You've successfully forced the browser to download our file. In the next lecture, let's work on deleting the receipt. In this lecture, we're going to delete a receipt. For this action to be performed, we must perform two steps. Firstly, the receipt must be deleted from the database. Secondly, it should be deleted from our file system. Both steps must be performed for a receipt to be officially deleted from our application. Let's take a look at the template for the home page. Scroll to the section where we display the receipts. In the loop, there's a form. The button for deleting a receipt is a form submission. In this form, we're submitting the request to the same URL as the request for downloading a receipt. The main difference is that we're using a delete method instead of a get method. If you were to look inside the form, we're rendering the CSRF and underscore method fields. Other than that, there's nothing we have to do with the form. Let's work on handling this request. Open the receipt controller. Scroll to the delete method. Before performing deletion, let's verify the transaction and receipt exist. Otherwise, we won't be able to delete the receipt. The code for validating this request is going to be the same as the code for validating the download request. Let's borrow the code from this method. In the download method, copy everything from the variables to the third conditional statement. Paste it into the delete method. After validating the request, we can begin to initiate the deletion process. Like most things, this logic will be outsourced in a service. The method will be called delete. Let's call this method from the receipt service instance. Our service is going to need the receipt to delete. Let's pass on the receipt variable. Next, we must define this method. Open the receipt service. In the parameter list, accept the receipt parameter as an array. Let's start with deleting the file. First, we must grab the path to the file. Define a variable called file path with the following path. Paths, storage, uploads, dot, slash, dot, receipt, storage, file name. Next, we can delete a file by running a function called unlink. PHP defines this function. It'll delete a file from our system. This function accepts a path to a file to delete. Let's pass in the file path variable. That should take care of deleting the file from our system. Next, let's delete the record in the database. We can do so with a simple query. Call the thisDB query method. Write the following query. Delete from receipts, where id equals colon id. The delete from keywords will delete a record or multiple records from the database. It's important to add the where clause. Otherwise, the database may delete all records. In this example, we're deleting records with a specific id. Since records may only contain unique ids, only one record will be deleted at a time. Next, in the array for the second argument, we're going to set the id placeholder to the receipt id variable. The last step is to redirect the user to the home page after performing the deletion. Head back to the controller. Call the redirect to function after initiating the deletion process from the service. We'll redirect users to the home page. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. Click on the red exit icon to initiate the deletion. After clicking the icon, the receipt has disappeared from our application. Great! We're finished with the receipt portion of our application. We're pretty much finished with most of the pages. The next section is going to add finishing touches and tackle topics we haven't had the opportunity to discuss. When you're ready, I'll see you in the next section. 
In this section, we're going to finalize our application before deploying it to the world. Unlike other sections, this section is going to contain lectures on various topics. We're not going to focus on a particular subject. We'll be jumping around from topic to topic. I added this section to cover topics that don't necessarily belong in a specific section. For this lecture, we're going to talk about magic numbers. Magic numbers are numeric values holding a special meaning. They're not just random numbers. Developers use numbers to represent a special meaning. One of the problems with magic numbers is their meaning isn't completely clear. Believe it or not, we've dealt with magic numbers already. In your editor, open the database file from our framework. This class is responsible for connecting the database with the PDO class. In the construct method, we're instantiating this class. The fourth argument is an array of additional settings. We're using this option to set the fetch mode to return results as an associative array. For the key name, we must use a specific value. In this example, we're using a constant called PDO attribute default fetch mode. We don't have to use this option. If we hover our mouse over this constant, the value of this constant is 19. Let's replace this constant with the number 19. Next, refresh the application in the browser. Our application is fully functional. We can perform searches, upload receipts, or create new transactions. It's not necessary to use the constant. Let's head back to our editors. If we want to configure the fetch mode, we must add this array with a key called 19. PHP searches for this item in the array to set the fetch mode. The question is, why? Using numbers for the name of a setting is common practice. Numbers are always unique. Therefore, it's unlikely that a number can represent two different settings. Unfortunately, it causes another problem. The intention of the number is unclear. Let's say we shared our project with another developer. We know that the number 19 changes the fetch mode. How does another developer know the meaning of this number? They don't, unless they look up the documentation or ask us. The intention of this number is unclear. The PHP community agrees with us. For this reason, they introduced a constant to store this number, which was the PDO attribute default fetch mode constant. There are two advantages to using variables to store magic numbers. Firstly, they provide clarity as to what the number represents. Variables should always describe the value they're storing. In this case, it's clear that this variable stores the fetch mode name. Secondly, they reduce the likelihood of a typo. Let's say I used the number 18 instead of 19. That's a completely different setting. However, PHP doesn't complain. Neither does my editor. As far as I'm aware, this is completely valid code. I won't be able to notice a problem until I test my application in the browser. If I were to type PDO colon colon, my editor recommends a list of values from this class. As I continue typing the constant, I can easily find the constant. But what if I forget to add a letter? If I make a typo, my editor throws an error. It's stating this constant is undefined. Being notified of errors straight away is beneficial. It gives me the opportunity to fix my typos. Overall, using constants for storing magic numbers provides a better user experience. In our application, we have magic numbers. Open the functions file. In this file, we have a function called redirect2. The status code is configured through the HTTP response code function. We're passing in 302, which is the status code for redirecting a user. Not all developers may be familiar with this status code. They may not understand what this number means. Therefore, we have a magic number. Let's fix it by creating a constant. Status codes are popular in every application. I think it would make sense for our framework to supply a list of status codes. In the framework directory, create a file called http.php. Next, set the namespace to framework. Afterward, define a class called http. Inside this class, define a public constant called redirect status code. Set this constant to 302. 
Next, head back to the functions file. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash HTTP class. Lastly, scroll back to the redirect to function. We can replace the number with the HTTP redirect status code constant. Our application will continue to work as before. If another developer encounters this function, they'll have a better understanding of what the status code does. In addition, they can still look at the number by hovering their mouse over the constant. Our editor reveals the true value of this constant. Magic numbers are commonly used in applications. It's completely optional to define constants for them, but as you can see, there are benefits to doing so. In the next lecture, let's move on to another concept. In this lecture, we're going to look at an alternative solution to logging a user out of the application. As a refresher, users are assigned special IDs known as a session ID. This ID is available via cookies. Behind the scenes, browsers and servers exchange cookies automatically. Therefore, you don't have to do anything on your part to access cookies. Let's take a look at the session ID. In your browser, open the developer tools. Under the storage panel, view the list of cookies. PHP always creates a cookie called PHP session ID. Currently, we're logging the user out of an application by destroying the session data on our server. However, the cookie remains in the user browser. If we want to be extra careful, we should destroy the cookie. Not necessary, but it doesn't hurt to do so. Let's update our logout logic to destroy the cookie. In your editor, open the user service class. Scroll to the logout method. First, we're going to destroy the session data. Currently, we're unsetting the session user variable. This removes the user's authentication status. While this solution works, you may want to remove additional data. Unsetting each item in an array can be cumbersome. Rather than calling the unset function, we can call the session destroy function. According to the function description, this function destroys all data in a session. So, why would we want to use the unset function over this function? By using the unset function, we can select which data to destroy. In some cases, developers will use sessions for tracking users. You may want to continue tracking users after they've logged out. In that case, destroying the session data may cause you to lose track of the user. For this reason, you may want to selectively unset items from the array as opposed to destroying the entire session data. Next, let's destroy the cookie. Currently, we're using the session regenerate ID function. This function assigns a new value to the cookie, but doesn't completely destroy it. Let's change that behavior by calling the setCookie function. Destroying a cookie is a matter of changing the expiration time. Cookies are only destroyed from the browser. Therefore, we must tell the browser that a cookie has gone past its expiration date. The setCookie function can be used for creating a cookie. If a cookie already exists, the browser will update the existing cookie with the settings passed into this function. There are a few settings we can configure. Firstly, we must provide the name. This name must match the name generated by PHP, which is a PHP session ID. Next, we must provide a value for the cookie. Let's set the value to an empty string. Afterward, we must provide an expiration date. The expiration date must be provided in seconds. Luckily, PHP has a function for grabbing the current time in seconds called time. By setting the expiration time to now, the cookie expires right away. However, as an extra precaution, developers will subtract a random number from this time. Thus setting the expiration date to a random time in the past. It's an extra assurance. Lastly, we must provide values for the other arguments. If you hover your mouse over this function, we must provide the other cookie settings. To save time, we can reuse the settings from the original cookie. Above this variable, define another variable called params set to the session get cookie params function. This function returns an array of the current settings for the session cookie. 
After grabbing this variable, we can pass the original values into the setCookie function. Pass the following values, paramsPath, paramsDomain, paramsSecure, paramsHttp only. Make sure you're passing in the values in the same order as me. The order of values does matter. After making those changes, let's try testing our code. In the browser, log into the application. Pay close attention to the session ID in the cookie. I'm going to log out. After doing so, I receive a completely new ID. Keep in mind, by starting a session, PHP generates a new ID when an ID isn't available. Since PHP generates a new ID, this means the original cookie was destroyed. We've successfully implemented the same behavior as before. The main difference is that we're destroying everything. Previously, we were only destroying the user variable and generating a new session ID. The cookie remained but was given a new value. Either solution is valid. In some cases, you may want to completely log a user out of an application. This behavior may be helpful for sites containing sensitive data, such as a banking application. In other cases, you may want to selectively remove data, such as for a social media site that may require tracking. It's completely up to you to decide based on the needs of your project. For our application, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, the effect is the same. In this lecture, we're going to render a 404 page for invalid routes. Our router is able to render pages for various routes. If we attempt to visit a route not registered in our application, we're greeted with a blank page. Ideally, our router should allow us to configure a 404 page for these scenarios. But why is it called a 404 page? 404 is the HTTP status code for pages that can't be found on a server. Let's update our router. In your editor, open the router file. The first step is to store a controller. Like the other routes, we'll define a controller for handling the response of the page. This controller is not going to be registered with the other routes. It's going to be stored in a completely separate property. Define a private array property called error handler. This property is going to be empty. Let's define a method for updating this property. At the bottom of the class, define a method called setErrorHandler. In the parameter list, we'll accept the controller as an array. During registration, the controller is going to be registered as an array. Within this array, the class name and method name will be required. This information will allow us to instantiate the class at any given moment. Afterward, we can invoke the method passed into the array. Let's set the error handler property to the controller parameter. After defining a property for storing the controller, let's define a method for instantiating this controller. Below the method, define another method called dispatch not found. This method will be responsible for creating an instance of our error handler. During this process, we may need to perform dependency injection. Let's accept an instance of the container class as an argument. I'm also going to add the question mark character at the beginning of the type. It's possible for the container not to be passed into the method. If that's the case, we shouldn't bother resolving dependencies. Inside this method, let's grab the controller and method. Destructure the error handler property into a variable called class and function. Next, we'll create the instance by setting a variable called controller instance to the following value, container, question mark, container, resolve class, colon, new class. Afterward, let's start applying the middleware. Define a variable called action set to an arrow function. This function will invoke the function from the controller instance. Afterward, we'll loop through the middleware. Add a for each loop. Set the expression to this middlewares as middleware. From within the loop, we'll resolve the middleware dependencies. It's going to be the same code as the code for resolving the controller's dependencies. Let's copy and paste this solution into the loop. After doing so, 
rename the variables to say middleware instead of controller. Lastly, reassign the action variable to an arrow function, where we call the middleware process method while passing on the original action function. After this loop, we can call the action function to initiate the middleware and controller. This is the exact same code as we have in the dispatch method. The main difference is that this method creates an instance of a specific controller, whereas the dispatch method selects a controller based on the route. We're almost finished. The next step is to dispatch this method. Scroll to the dispatch method. In this method, we're performing a loop to find a route. If a route is never found, a blank page appears. Rather than rendering a blank page, let's dispatch the 404 page by calling the thisDispatchNotFound method with the container parameter. Add this code after the foreach loop. We're finished with the router. It'll be able to dispatch the 404 error if a route can't be found. The next step is to register a controller for handling a 404 page. Currently, we're creating the router through the application class. Our project won't have access to the router. We'll do what we did for the other methods in our router. Let's define a method on the application class to pass on the controller. Open the application class. At the bottom of the class, define a method called setErrorHandler. In the parameter list, add the controller parameter as an array. Lastly, call the thisRouterSetErrorHandler method with the controller parameter. After creating this method, let's create a controller and template for the 404 page. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist. This gist contains the code for the controller and 404 page. I want you to create the controller and template with this code. Make sure to create them in their respective directories. I'm going to quickly create these files. The controller is very simple. We're creating a class with a single dependency, which is the template engine class. In the not found method, we're rendering the not found template. Let's take a look at the template. The template doesn't have anything unique about it. All we're doing is telling the user we can't find the page they're looking for from our app. The last step is to register this controller. Open the routes file. Import the error controller from the app backslash controllers namespace. Next, at the bottom of the function, call the app set error handler method. Pass in an array. Inside this array, set the controller to error controller class and the method to not found. We're finished. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, navigate to the home page. As you can see, the page continues to get rendered. Now let's try visiting a page that doesn't exist. This time, we're greeted with a 404 page. There's a button you can click on to go to the home page. Awesome! We've successfully handled 404 requests. There are a few improvements we can make to our solution, but we'll leave it at that. Feel free to make optimizations as you see fit. For now, let's move on to the next topic. In this section, it's finally time to deploy our project to the world. After spending hours developing our project, it would be a shame if we couldn't share it with the world. Let's learn how to upload our project to a server. Before we get started, there's one point I want to emphasize. There are a lot of features we could add to our application. For example, we can add support for signed URLs, categories, or develop an administrative dashboard for managing our site. Our app is fairly minimal. Implementing those features would take hours, if you want. You're more than welcome to continue building our project. In fact, I encourage you to do so. This project can be added to your portfolio of projects when applying for jobs. To stand out from the other students who've created the same project, consider changing the appearance of the project or adding new features. It'll improve your chances of getting a job. Let's talk about a few crucial concepts. Firstly, what does it mean to deploy a project? 
Deploying a project is the process of uploading a project from a local development environment to a production environment. Typically, this is the last step performed after you've finished developing a project. The question becomes, where do we deploy our project? If you were to look online, you're going to come across thousands of results for the best PHP hosting provider. Choosing a hosting provider is going to depend on the needs of your project. There isn't a single universal answer. For our project, we must have a server with support for PHP, Apache, and MariaDB, as these were the programs installed with XAMPP. There are two types of hosts, managed and unmanaged hosting. Unmanaged hosting is when a company offers a server without providing additional services. Developers are completely expected to provision a server. Provisioning describes the process of setting up a server with the required software to run an application. In addition to setting up a server, we are responsible for monitoring and maintaining the server. On the other hand, managed hosting is where a company offers additional services and tools to help you host your application. Tools include monitoring and automated backups. Either type of hosting are viable for any application. Typically, unmanaged hosting requires a lot of knowledge up front. Deploying a project can take time. If there are any problems, it's up to you to solve them. Managed hosting is fast and easy. However, companies will charge a higher price to help you manage your server. For this course, we're going to be using a managed hosting service. We don't have the time to completely configure a server. To save time, we'll be using a managed hosting service called Cloudways. Cloudways is one of the best services for PHP applications. They make it extremely easy to get up and running. Using a service does cost money. Luckily, Cloudways may offer a free trial. This trial may not always be available. In that case, you'll need to purchase a server from them. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to Cloudways. To be transparent, I do receive a commission from Cloudways if you sign up via my link. I appreciate the support. Before moving on to the next lecture, I want you to create an account. We'll be using Cloudways to deploy our project. After creating an account, log in and navigate to the dashboard. Once you have that ready, I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to configure a server for our application. After signing up for an account, you should be able to view the dashboard. I'm using the new dashboard from Cloudways. They're slowly rolling it out to users. If you don't see the same dashboard as me, chances are you're using the old dashboard. There should be a link at the top of the page to try out the new dashboard. From the dashboard, there is going to be a button for adding an application. Click on it. The first step to creating an application is to select the type of application. Cloudways is a service for hosting PHP applications. There are different types of PHP applications. From WordPress to Laravel, we have a custom application. So, select the Custom App option. Next, we must provide a name for our application. Let's set the name to PHPiggy. Afterward, we must provide a name for our server. So far, we've developed a single application on our machines. However, we're not limited to one project. Most likely, you're going to have a few projects on your machine for various clients. In a similar sense, a single server can host multiple projects. For this reason, we must create a server in addition to creating an application. Let's set the name of our server to Personal for Personal Projects. Cloudways uses cloud services for hosting projects. We have various choices at our disposal. I always recommend DigitalOcean because it's the cheapest option. After selecting a server, we can select the size of our server. I'm going to select 1 GB. We don't need a large server. We're the only ones who'll be using our application. Lastly, we must select a location. The location can impact the performance of your site. The farther a server is away from your users, the longer it'll take them to load your application. You should always pick a location closest to your users. I'm going to select New York. However, you should pick the location closest to you. After making those changes, we can create our server. Cloudways will begin provisioning a server for you. It'll install the necessary software for running PHP applications. This process may take a few moments. Feel free to take a break and go out. 
We won't be able to do anything until Cloudways is finished preparing our server. I'll see you when my server is ready. Alright, my server is finally finished. We can click on the server to begin configuring it. The server's configuration is split into multiple pages. The first section is called Master Credentials. Cloudways creates a user for accessing our server. We can use this information to access our server via SFTP or SSH. We'll be using these credentials in a future lecture. The next section is called Monitoring. This section allows you to view resources utilized by your applications. Monitoring your site is critical for finding bugs or potential issues. If an application is using an abnormal amount of resources, this should prompt you to investigate the issue. Afterward, we have a section called Manage Services. Services refer to the programs installed on your machine. As you can see, our server has everything it needs, from PHP to a database. Moving along, we have a section called Settings and Packages. Unlike the other sections, I want to configure a few settings from this section. First, let's set the Execution Time option to 30. The Execution Time option determines the time a script is allowed to run. Typically, our scripts have been running for a second. However, scripts run longer depending on the actions performed by our code. One situation where a script can run for a few seconds is handling large file uploads. Large file uploads can take a while to process. Previously, the execution time was set to 300 seconds. That's way too long. If a script takes 300 seconds to execute, the resources consumed by a script aren't released until the script is finished running. There isn't a reason for a page to take that long to load. It's recommended to set the execution time to 30 seconds. You can set it even lower if you know a script won't take this long to run. Afterward, let's set the Upload Size option to 20. The Upload Size option is measured in megabytes. We're going to limit the uploads to 20 megabytes. It's unlikely for a receipt to be larger than this size. Lastly, let's set the Error Reporting option to Production. We're not interested in most errors. Setting this option to production ignores most errors logged in production. We only want critical errors. After making those changes, save the form. Next, let's click on the Advanced tab. We can configure the various services in our application. There's only one setting I want to modify. For the Max Input Variables option, change this value to 200. As we know, Values can be sent with a request. PHP stores these values in variables called get, post, or cookies. Theoretically, a hacker can try sending excessive data by changing a form on our page. We should reject requests that attempt to send excessive data by lowering this number. Setting this number to 200 only allows for 200 values to be sent with a request. There isn't a reason to accept any more information than this value. Let's save the changes. Click on the Packages tab. This tab allows us to change the versions of each service. I recommend changing the PHP version to 8. As for MariaDB, make sure the version is 10.6. These are the latest versions of each service. It's always considered good practice to use the latest version of a software to avoid the possibility of bugs or errors. Let's move on to the next tab. Cloudways is capable of cleaning our server. As we know, file uploads are temporarily stored on our server. We're charged for storing these files. Cloudways can automate the process of deleting temporary files so that we don't get charged longer than we have to. By default, this feature should be enabled. If not, enable it. We can select what type of data gets removed periodically. For our application, we can safely remove everything. Lastly, click on the Maintenance tab. The Maintenance tab gives us the opportunity to put our server on maintenance. Users won't be able to use our site until maintenance is complete. This feature won't be necessary, but it's nice to know it's available. Click on the Security section. We have the option of whitelisting IPs to connect to our server via SFTP and SSH. 
If you're working on a team, you can limit who has access to the server by listing their IP in this section. For our needs, it won't be necessary. Let's move on to the next section, which is called Vertical Scaling. This section allows you to modify the resources required by the server. You can add more resources if your site starts to become busy with traffic. Before adding more resources, I always recommend checking out the monitoring section to determine if this step is necessary. Let's click on the backup section. Backing up an application is always a critical step. If you accidentally break something, reverting to an older version of an app can fix things. However, backing up an application takes time. Luckily, Cloudways offers automatic backups, which you can schedule based on your needs. Let's click on the last section called SMTP. SMTP refers to an email server. If your application sends emails, you can configure the email server for your app in this section. Email servers are not free. For our application, it won't be necessary. We're finished configuring our server. Keep in mind, the server settings apply to all applications hosted on the server. Once you've made those changes, let's start configuring the application. In this lecture, we're going to configure the application in Cloudways. There are a few adjustments we'll need to make. First, let's navigate to the page for configuring the application settings. From the dashboard, you should be presented with a list of applications. Click on the PHPiggy application. Immediately, you're given a custom URL for previewing your application. Feel free to click on this URL. By default, Cloudways provides a default page. As long as you're able to access your app from this domain, you should be good to go. Back in the dashboard, let's go through some of the settings. I won't be going over every section, only the necessary ones. Click on the SSL Certificate section. By default, Cloudways provides us with a custom domain for previewing this site. This domain automatically has an SSL certificate, which encrypts data sent between the browser and server. If you plan on using a custom domain, you must configure a certificate for that domain. You can do so through this section. For our application, we aren't going to be using a custom domain. The free preview domain will suffice for our needs. Just thought I should mention this section as encrypting connections is critical for any application. Let's move on to a section called Application Settings. We can configure various settings for our app from this section. The most important field is the web root option. For security reasons, we decided to dedicate a directory for publicly accessing files. We don't want users to access files outside of the public directory. It's common practice to have a public directory for most projects. Developers use different names. By default, Cloudways assumes the directory name is called public HTML. This directory is where our application will be stored. However, we don't want the entire application accessible via this directory. We only want the public directory to be accessible from the web. Let's add to this directory by adding the public folder. After making those changes, our application is ready. We aren't going to configure anything else. In the next lecture, let's upload our project to Cloudways. In this lecture, we're going to deploy our project to Cloudways. There are different ways of performing this step. A common approach is to use SFTP. For this course, we're going to be using GitHub. In an earlier section, we learned how to use GitHub for storing copies of our project. It's completely possible for Cloudways to grab a project via GitHub for deployment. Let's try using Git to deploy our project. First, we must make a few adjustments. Open the GitHub desktop application. On the left side, I'm given a list of files changed in our project. Overall, I'm fine with the list of files. However, I don't want to commit the files from the storage slash uploads directory. These files are specific to my copy of the application. These files are not going to be available in a production environment. Switch over to your editor. One solution is to delete these files. However, it would be annoying to constantly delete files every time I update my project. Luckily, we can tell Git to ignore files in a specific directory. 
Git does not allow for empty directories to be uploaded. A common trick to include an empty directory is to create a file called .git keep. Inside this directory, create this file. This allows for the directory to be included with our repository. However, what if we had other files? The next step would be to tell git to ignore the files from this directory. Open the git ignore file. Add the following storage slash uploads asterisk exclamation point storage slash uploads slash dot git keep. The asterisk character acts as a wildcard character. If we include this character, we're telling git to match any file name. As a result, all files are ignored from this directory. At the same time, we don't want to ignore the git keep file. On the next line, we're writing the complete path to this file with the inclusion of the exclamation point character. This character instructs git not to ignore this file. There's another file I want to include. Add the .env file. Environment files should be excluded from the repository. There's one more final thing I want to include in our project. Inside the public directory, create a file called .htaccess. Cloudways does not allow us to modify the Apache configuration. In most cases, I prefer to use the official Apache configuration. If we want to enable the rewrite engine, we must do so from the .htaccess file. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist. This gist contains the code required for the .htaccess file. It's the same code we wrote for the vhosts file. The main difference is that we're not using virtual hosts. This feature was only required for development. It's not something we'll need in a production environment. Paste this code into the .htaccess file. Switch over to the GitHub desktop application. In a few moments, the files should be updated to reflect the changes made to our application. Great! Let's provide a summary that says the following. Production. Next, commit the changes. Lastly, push the changes to the origin. We want our changes to be reflected on GitHub. By not pushing the changes to GitHub, the changes will only be available to our local repository. After the changes have been pushed, click on the View on GitHub button. The page should inform you the repository was updated moments ago. We've successfully pushed the final product of our project to GitHub. The next step is to instruct Cloudways to pull this project onto its servers. Switch over to the dashboard. From the list of applications, click on the PHPGE application. Next, click on the Deployment via Git section. Click on the Generate button. GitHub and Cloudways are two completely different products. A key must be generated to be able to connect them. Cloudways can help you generate the key. If you click on the View Key button, you should be able to view it. Copy this key to your clipboard. Next, switch back to the project on GitHub. On this page, click on the Settings tab. On the sidebar, click on the Deploy Keys link. At the top right corner, add a new key. Paste the key into the form. Let's set the name to Cloudways. Lastly, add the key. After adding the key, we must provide Cloudways with an SSH link for our project. This information can be grabbed by clicking on the Code tab. There's a button available for grabbing links called Code. If we click on it, there's a tab for grabbing the SSH URL. Copy this URL to your clipboard. Head back to Cloudways. In the Git Remote Address field, paste the URL and press Authenticate. Cloudways should have successfully grabbed the repository. It's going to present us with a list of branches. We're interested in the main branch. Nothing else needs to be changed. After selecting this branch, click Start Deployment. 
Cloudways should have successfully pulled the project. We can verify the project was pulled by viewing the logs. According to Cloudways, it was able to successfully grab the project from GitHub. We're almost finished. The last step is to configure our project. In our repository, we aren't including everything necessary for running the project. The vendor directory is completely missing. We must install our dependencies before our project can work. In addition, the environment variables must be added. Only the environment example file was committed to the project. Cloudways provides us with a database for our applications. We'll create a new environment file to use this database instead of our local database. Navigate to the Cloudways dashboard. I want you to navigate to the server settings. Installing packages must be performed via the command line. We must connect to our server to perform this action. Keep in mind, the server is in a completely remote location. We're no longer working on our personal machines. Connecting to a server is performed via SSH. Under the Master Credentials section, we can access our server via SSH by launching the SSH terminal from the browser. During this process, your browser may warn you from accessing this page. Just proceed with the page anyway. After doing so, you should be presented with a command line from your browser. We're going to be prompted to log in. The login credentials are available from Cloudways. Type them into the command line. For the password, you may not be able to view your password as you're typing it. I didn't edit my video. By default, terminals censor passwords to prevent people from looking over your shoulder to view a password. Rest assured, your password is being registered as you type it. Alright, I'm logged in. Currently, we're logged into the entire server. If we type the ls command, we're given a list of directories on our server. Cloudways provides a server called Applications. This folder contains all applications stored on your server. Let's move into the directory with the cd command. Next, run the ls command again. This time, we're given a list of application folders. Let's move into this directory. If you run the ls command again, you will be given a list of files and folders for the application. The folder we care about is the public HTML folder. As you can recall, we deployed our project to this directory. Let's move into it. Let's run the ls command one last time. This time, we are presented with the files and folders we wrote in the past few sections. This confirms our project was uploaded to Cloudway servers. There may be an additional file called index.php. This file wasn't originally in our project. Cloudways created this file for the default landing page of our application. We can remove it by running the rm index.php command. The rm command is short for remove. It's a command for deleting a file from a system. From this directory, we can start installing dependencies. Run the composer install command. That takes care of the first problem. The next step is to create the environment file. Run the following command, vim.env. Vim is a text editor program for writing code. It's similar to Visual Studio Code. The main difference is that it aims to be as minimalistic as possible. Unlike traditional code editing programs, we don't have an interface. We can only write code. If we want to perform actions from within our text editor, we can use keyboard shortcuts. The vim command launches the editor. We can access a file or create a new file. In our case, we're creating a new file called .env. In this file, let's start adding our environment variables. First, set the app environment variable to production. Next, set the db host variable to localhost. Afterward, set the db driver variable to MySQL. Set the db port variable to 3306. Lastly, we can add the db name 
DB user, and DB pass variables. These variables can be found in the Cloudways dashboard. Head over to the dashboard. Navigate to the PHPGE application page. Under the Access Details section, click on the Database tab. From this tab, you will be given the database username and password. Add these values to their respective variables. Once you've added those values, we can save changes. You can press the Escape key to perform an action on a file. At the bottom left corner, we must provide a command for the action we'd like to perform. There are two actions we'd like to perform, which are saving the file and exiting Vim. We can do so by running the following command, colon wq. After creating the environment file, let's run the migration. We created a custom command for this task. Run the following command, composer run script phpgy. The script should have executed successfully without throwing an error. If it runs successfully, you've successfully connected to your database. Our script was able to generate the tables necessary for our project. Let's test our work. In the browser, refresh the preview page provided by Cloudways. Our application is fully functional. Awesome! We can create an account, upload receipts, and search through our transactions. Everything should be fully functional. Pat yourself on the back. This took a lot of work to pull off. We can definitely improve the deployment process by automating deployments. Currently, we must manually deploy our project every time we make a change. Automating the deployment process is not something we'll be doing. However, if you're interested in automating this step, you can look up GitHub Actions. For now, this will suffice. I'll see you in the next lecture. Wow! We're finally at the end. PHP is a great programming language for web development. Hopefully, you agree. You're probably thinking, what's next? Where do you go from here? You have a couple of options at your disposal. Firstly, you can try applying for jobs. You have all the knowledge required for tackling pure PHP projects. Another option is to continue honing your PHP skills. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a site owned by me. It's a PHP blog for various topics. This site is going to be updated through the years with tips and tricks for writing PHP. You should definitely check it out to learn more about PHP. In addition, I have additional courses on various PHP tools and frameworks. You can view my profile on Udemy for them. WordPress is one of the most popular PHP projects in the world. If you want to learn a CMS, you should check it out. Similar to this course, these courses are project-based. By the end of each course, you'll have another project to add to your portfolio. Regardless of what you do, you should be proud of yourself. Learning a programming language isn't easy. It requires a lot of work and dedication. If you enjoyed the course, please leave a review. It encourages me to continue creating courses. Hopefully, I see you again in another course. Until next time, see ya!